Having found himself reincarnated into the My Hero world, our main protagonist will try to live up to his namesake. What's up, ladies and gentlemen? It's your boy, Omni-sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Iron Man in MHA, Part 2. Hit that thumbs up. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Third person's POV. You have three seconds to pack up your things and leave, Tony said as he leaned back in his chair. You can't just kick us out. You'll need all of our help, a woman with green snakeskin and yellow eyes started to say. Security, Tony happily sang out. The door then opened, and a group of men wearing security gear appeared. Yes, Mr. Stark, they said with a bow. Take him, him, and her out. They are from here on out banned from this fine establishment, Tony said, pointing to a man with slanted eyes, another man with large teeth that were too big for his mouth, and the snake-like woman. Hiroto, the man with slanted eyes, jumped up from his seat in a rage and charged at Tony, grabbing him by the neck. Listen here, you brat. Tony moved his hands behind him and hit a few buttons on his watch before it expanded, covering his hands and palms. Hiroto's words were cut short as he was suddenly blasted back and slammed against a wall, taking it down with him and burying him in rubble. Tony had a red glove over his hand as he aimed where Hiroto once stood. Take them away, he said, fixing his tie. The security guards took hold of the others and escorted them out. Tony then put his watch back in place and sat back down. Now that the trash is taken care of, we can begin to organize this mess of a company. So, any questions? Tony saw all of their hands go up. Too bad, he said, not caring for their questions. All of their hands went down. You all have to learn that when it comes to me, your opinions don't really matter. So suck it up. Your main jobs are going to be making sure everything is running and working as intended. For starters, we'll be focusing on the medical sector of this company, as that's where I believe our chance to make the most money as efficiently as possible lies. Some wanted to protest and speak up against the way Tony was speaking to them and treating them, but then they saw the hole in their office wall and hesitated. If you all would ever so kindly turn the page of what my lovely assistant handed to you, you would see some of the products I have in store. They became curious and turned the page, mostly seeing robotic limbs, most of them cybernetic. We are in the age of heroes, which means missing limbs and body parts are all too common, unfortunately. Even with technological advances, prosthetic limbs are still so underdeveloped. Tony then went on to explain a tiny bit of his future plan for the company. The reason was simple, so they wouldn't bother him. Once they had grown confident in his skills and innovations, they immediately grew interested in what Tony was planning and were drawn into the most important part, the prospect of money. The more Tony talked, the more his charisma shined through, and they began to nod and agree with him. Once they were in and hooked on Tony's ideas, Tony immediately set everything into motion. One month later, in just one month, Stark Industries went through a lot of changes that helped it rise from the ashes. They soon became a giant in the technology industry. One of the main reasons was cybernetics. Many retired heroes would give a lot of money to be able to do hero work again, and Stark Cybernetics were simply ahead of their time. But they didn't only focus on cybernetics. Just like the main Stark Industries, the one in Japan also focused on making support items for heroes. Due to their quality materials and how advanced they were, they became a hot-selling item, especially when top A-rank heroes used them. Apart from Stark Industries' development, not much happened in their daily lives. Melissa and Momo had become good friends very quickly due to their high intellect. Right now, Melissa was looking outside with an excited expression. They heard a strong whooshing sound from the skies, and as they looked up, they saw a man land with a small squat in front of them. The man was tall, muscular, with blonde hair and two large strands standing upright. The man stood up straight and put his fists by his waist as he posed with a large smile. I am here. Uncle Might, 
Melissa ran up to him and jumped into his arms. Ha ha ha. Melissa, it's so good to see you. So that's all might, huh? Talk about Aura. Tony thought as he looked at how they greeted each other. Imagine my surprise when I heard from David you would be staying in Japan for a couple of years. All Might said with his signature large smile. All Might then turned towards Tony. And you, young man, must be Anthony Stark. David mentioned you as well, he said, offering his hand. Tony shook it. Yeah, I am. So you're All Might. All Might smiled at them as he asked, Are you too hungry? I know a great ramen place around here. Melissa nodded eagerly wanting to spend time with her uncle. Tony shrugged his shoulders. I haven't really had a chance to try authentic food here, so I'm okay with it. Perfect. All Might said in a cheery voice. He then scooped up Tony in his arms. Dude, what are you doing? On hand. Tony didn't have much of a chance to say anything as All Might leapt into the air. Whoa! Melissa shouted with her hands in the air. When she turned to look at Tony, she saw him looking at her with a straight face, causing her to grow embarrassed. Due to All Might's speed, they soon arrived at their destination. Everyone started greeting All Might excitedly upon seeing him, as he was a big celebrity due to his status as the number one S-rank hero. But even as they greeted All Might, it appeared he was a regular, as they respected his privacy. Surprisingly, even Tony was recognized, as he himself was a celebrity in his own right. Having just taken over Stark Industries, it had grown beyond belief in his hands. Soon they all sat down in the little restaurant, which gave off a homey vibe to all who entered. As they sat down, they looked at their menus and placed their orders. I recommend the miso ramen. It's the best this place has, All Might suggested. Without much complaint, they followed his advice and ordered. So, tell me, what are you doing here in Japan? All Might asked, patting Melissa's head. Melissa, who was happily swinging her feet, answered, I'm Tony's secretary and lab assistant. I'm learning a lot from him, so I kind of followed him here to continue learning. He's incredible. You should see the things he can do. Oh, is that so, young man? So tell me what you've learned, All Might asked like a caring uncle. It's mostly how to build things and create great hero support items. Thanks to it, we're helping out so many people, Melissa said with pride in her voice. When the food arrived, they clapped their hands, said the phrase, and began to eat. As Melissa and All Might continued to talk and eat, Tony kept thinking about one single thing. How the hell is he alive? And how is he even able to eat with a destroyed stomach? Third person's POV. During their lunch together, All Might was a bit surprised to learn that Tony was the one leading Stark Industries. He was a bit slow on the uptake. Wait, are you serious? And you're saying Melissa here is your secretary? Did you just get it now? Tony asked, looking at him weirdly. What did you think she was talking about? All Might grew embarrassed as he rubbed the back of his head. I thought you kids were playing a game together and you two were gonna school here. You know, I pride myself on not being easily surprised. But just wow, Tony said, shaking his head in disbelief. Melissa nodded. I have to agree with Tony on this, Uncle Might. It's kind of embarrassing it took you this long to figure out. Please cut me some slack. How was I supposed to know a little kid would be such a big deal? All Might said, his large smile faltering a bit. Do you not pay attention to the news? Tony said with a raised brow, proud of his popularity. All Might shook his head. I mostly spend my time helping people however I can. Melissa's eyes shone with admiration while Tony nodded in understanding. All Might then turned towards Melissa. So you're helping young Stark in making equipment for heroes? Melissa nodded. It's awesome. Even though we're corkless, it's like we're making a difference in our own way. You're corkless as well, young Stark? I would have assumed it was your cork that made you smart enough to handle a company on your own. All Might said in astonishment. Tony knocked on the side of his head. All authentic. They soon finished their meal and paid for their food. As they walked, Melissa and All Might talked about David and how he was doing. But as they were in the middle of their conversation, a speeding car passed by, with people shooting from it. Not long after, police cars were right on their tail. Tony and Melissa saw All Might struggling to make a decision, his gaze shifting between them and the direction the speeding cars went. 
So they made the decision for him. Just go, Uncle Might. You're a hero, so do what a hero is supposed to do. Don't worry about us. We can hang out another day. Are you sure? How are you? All Might began. But Tony interrupted him with his phone in hand. Just go. I already texted our chauffeur to pick us up. Don't worry about us. Tony shooed him off. All Might gave them one last look. It was nice seeing you again, Melissa. And it was nice meeting you, young Stark, he said before leaping into the air. What an interesting fellow, Tony said, watching him go into the distance. Melissa nodded smugly. Uncle Might is the best. It didn't take the chauffeur long to arrive and pick them up, taking them back to the Yairozu residence. Momo was happy to see them, as they had become her only friends. Everyone who had approached her before only wanted to be friends because of her family's name and money, which she had learned one too many times, leading her to start homeschooling. Upon learning about her past, Melissa felt a bit of pity towards her. After days of exchanging stories, they became friends. As Melissa and Momo started spending time together, Tony found out she was someone he could tolerate and didn't mind being friends with. When they arrived, Momo looked at them shyly. She pressed her thumbs together and said, You guys said you were going to help me train my quirk. We haven't forgotten. Don't worry, Tony said with a playful eye roll. Sorry if I was being a bother, Momo muttered. You're not. If you were, Tony wouldn't have been friends with you, Melissa said teasingly as she patted his back. Really? Melissa nodded. Tony is very simple. If he finds something annoying, he ignores it until it goes away. But if he finds it interesting or not bothersome, he doesn't mind being around it. Stop speaking like I'm autistic or something, Tony said with a straight face, causing Melissa and Momo to giggle. Momo grabbed both of their hands and led them to her training room. One year later, are you guys really going to let me see it? Momo asked excitedly. We're taking you there, aren't we? Tony said, leaning back in the limo seat. But this is your laboratory we're talking about. Even I, who have been your closest friend, haven't been there before, Momo said with enthusiasm. That's because Tony was customizing it and adding upgrades. He was very indecisive about many things, so it took a while for it to finally be complete. Hey, you wanted the walls to be purely white. There's no way I was going to have that. The interior design needed to be perfect. White hurts my eyes too much, Tony said, closing his eyes. They soon arrived at what appeared to be a seaside mansion perched on top of a cliff. As they got out, the limo turned around and drove away by itself, as it was self-driven. Momo looked at the giant house in amazement. If you own this, why do you live with me? My mother, Tony sighed, and with that, they all headed inside. Once inside, they heard a British woman's voice. Welcome back, master. What plans do we have today? Aren't you the one supposed to keep tabs on that? Friday? Tony teased. Who is that? Momo leaned towards Melissa to ask. That's Friday, his AI. He has an AI? Momo asked in surprise. They then heard the AI sigh. Master, you know I meant. What are your orders for today? Then you should have said that in the first place. Tony continued to retort. Congratulations, Tony. You managed to get an AI tired of you, Melissa said looking towards Tony. For your information, I programmed her to be that way. Isn't that right, Friday? Yes, master. You said, and I quote, I'm gonna make her a little sassy. There's no better AI than a British bantering AI. Anyways, onto the tour, Tony said as he began to lead them around. There's the couch. There's the television. There's the piano. The way to the balcony leads to an amazing view of the sea. Tony pointed to everything, giving minimal explanations. They soon arrived at the piano, where Tony sat down. Come a little closer, he told Momo. They stood by the piano as Tony began to play the Marvel theme song. Not that they recognized it. Soon, they heard the sound of gears shifting and something mechanical moving. They looked around to see the space around the piano breaking away from the floor and starting to sink down as they descended. Whoa, Momo said as they sank further down. She looked around and saw the platform transporting them to Tony's underground lab. There were cars of different colors and designs, workbenches with various materials scattered around, 
and in the middle of the lab was a marshmallow-like figure with a small broom sweeping in place. But what surprised Momo the most was the 15 suits of armor behind glass panels, each of different colors. When Momo looked up, she saw that the place they came down from was closed. Friday, how long has he been cleaning that spot? Tony asked as they reached the ground. It has been five hours, master. Tony sighed, Baymax, buddy, when I said clean this place up and I pointed to the floor, I meant to clean the entire lab, not just the spot I was pointing to. Baymax looked towards Tony and gave his circular wave. I see. I will now begin cleaning the entire laboratory. He's so cute, Momo said, looking at Baymax. Melissa nodded in agreement. Meanwhile, Tony stepped away from them and spread his arms out. Anyways, Momo, I officially welcome you to the lab. Hope you enjoy the visit. Third person's POV. One year later, Momo stood in the middle of an arena, holding a staff in her hands as she circled her opponent. Baymax stood opposite her, also holding a staff. He remained in his stance but followed Momo's movements closely. As Baymax turned his head, Momo rushed forward and swung her staff, but Baymax quickly reacted and blocked it with his own. The sound of their staffs clashing echoed throughout the arena. Tony, however, didn't pay any mind to the noise. He had a visor over his eyes, examining everything. All right, Friday, I can't believe it has taken us this long. But what's the current progress on the Vibranium project? Tony said as he hung by a bar. Based on our last simulation, 99%, sir, Friday responded, having switched to using sir instead of master after Tony turned 12. That 1% has caused too many failures for too long. Let's solve it here and now, Tony said, pulling himself up. Bring up the molecular structure of our last simulation and highlight the point of failure. On it, sir, Friday responded. The room dimmed as holographic displays flickered to life. The molecular structure of vibranium appeared, a complex lattice of interconnected atoms and energy bonds. Tony released the bar, landing lightly on his feet after finishing his sets of pull-ups, his sweaty muscular figure in display. He approached the holographic display, scrutinizing the intricate details. All right, let's see where it's falling apart. Friday highlighted a section of the lattice in red. This is the weak point, sir. The bonds in this region are unstable, leading to the material structural failure under stress. Tony narrowed his eyes, analyzing the highlighted section. It's the intratomic bonds. They're not maintaining integrity. What are the parameters of this region compared to the rest? Friday pulled up additional data, overlaying it onto the holographic display. The atomic spacing and bonding energy are slightly off in this region. It appears to be a result of an inconsistent synthesis process. Tony nodded deep in thought. We need to stabilize these bonds. What are our options for modifying the synthesis process to achieve uniformity? Friday displayed several potential adjustments. We can modify the temperature gradient during synthesis or introduce a catalyst to promote uniform bonding. Alternatively, adjusting the pressure could ensure consistent atomic spacing. Tony reviewed the options. Let's start with the catalyst. Bring up the simulations for introducing a stabilizing agent into the process. Friday complied, running simulations in real time. The catalyst is showing promise, sir. It increases bonding energy consistency and reduces atomic spacing variability. Tony smiled. That's it. We'll integrate the catalyst into the synthesis process. Run the full simulation and prepare for a live test. Friday acknowledged, simulation running now, sir. Preparing for a live synthesis test upon completion. Tony stepped back, satisfied. Finally, we're gonna crack this. Let's make some real vibranium. Simulation complete, sir. The catalyst integration appears successful. We're ready for a live synthesis test, Friday reported. Tony took a deep breath, a mix of excitement and determination in his eyes. All right, let's do this. Prepare the lab and begin the synthesis process. Friday activated the lab systems and the machinery word to life. The room filled with a hum of energy as the synthesis chamber prepared the necessary materials. Tony donned his protective gear and moved to the control panel. Initializing the synthesis process now, 
Tony said, his fingers dancing across the interface, introducing the catalyst, increasing pressure, and adjusting the temperature gradient. The chamber glowed as the materials within started to react. Tony watched the readouts closely, monitoring every parameter. Minutes felt like hours as the process continued, each step crucial to the success of their endeavor. Temperature stable, pressure within optimal range. Catalyst performing as expected, Friday reported, her voice steady and reassuring. Tony's eyes were glued to the display, the molecular structure of vibranium slowly forming. Come on, hold together, he muttered under his breath. The final phase of the process began, and the chamber's glow intensified. Tony's heart raced as he watched the bond solidify, the lattice structure stabilizing. Finally, the process completed with a soft chime, and the chamber powered down. Process complete, sir. The vibranium sample is ready for extraction, Friday announced. Tony approached the chamber, his hands steady but his anticipation palpable. He carefully opened the chamber and retrieved the sample. The vibranium gleamed with a unique, almost otherworldly luster. Friday, run a full analysis on the sample, Tony instructed, holding the vibranium up to the light. Friday conducted the scans, her voice filled with pride. The sample is stable, sir. All parameters are within the desired ranges. Congratulations, you've done it. A broad smile spread across his face. We've done it, Friday. This is a game changer. He placed the vibranium sample in a secure container and turned back to the control panel. Start production protocols. We've got a lot of work ahead of us. As the lab buzzed with activity, Tony couldn't help but feel a surge of accomplishment. The creation of vibranium marked a beginning for him, and he has created something which once was something make-believe, he was now ready to push the boundaries of what was possible. I still didn't like how long that took me, though, Tony said with a sigh as he looked at the 17 pieces of armor on display. Not to mention, there's also the adamantium I have to come up with. But with this now complete, it should be much easier, or so I hope. One step at a time. Let me just bask in this moment, Tony said to himself. All right, Friday, make a new file, Mark 18, Vibranium. On it, sir, Friday readily replied. Have it powered by kinetic energy and focus on stealth. Add retro-reflective panels to give it an invisibility aspect as well. Add stealth suit in parentheses to the file name. Tony then chuckled to himself. Friday, add another file and name it Vibranium Shield. It has nothing to do with the suits, not yet. Just add it as a side project to remind me to add it later. Tony laughed again as another idea came to mind. You know what, Friday? Make another file over the one I just mentioned. Name it Mark 19. Iron Patriot. Ha 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 ha. I want it to have a round shield on its back and be painted blue, white, and red. Tony pretended to wipe imaginary tears. Man, I crack myself up, he said before stopping abruptly. Hey, wait. Where's Melissa? She's at the monthly hangout with the S-rank hero All Might, Friday informed him. What? She went without me? That traitor. It's not like I like spending time with that musclehead idiot anyway. Tony grumbled. Sir, my sensors detected a lie. What? Since when do you have a lie detector? When did I make something like that? Tony asked, surprised and defensive. I don't, sir. I was lying. I'm unplugging you. It's night-night, Friday. Wait, sir. No, I apologize, Friday hurriedly said before Tony could act. Tony scoffed, as the Japanese would say, stupid baka Friday. Sir, baka and stupid mean the same thing. That's it. I'm waterboarding your circuits as punishment, Tony said with a straight face. Third person's POV. Tony was now 13 years old, and not much had happened in recent months, apart from the fact that Tony had started delving into biology. With all his tools and knowledge, Tony could technically be one of the world's best surgeons or doctors if he truly wanted to. Apart from that, Tony and All Might had become somewhat close friends, largely due to Melissa always wanting to take Tony with her during her monthly visits with All Might. Momo had only met All Might occasionally. One day, All Might, Melissa, and Tony were walking down a beach, 
each with an ice cream in hand as they strolled by the setting sun. You too, I have something to share with you, All Might said in a somber tone. That you're dying? Tony said as he licked his ice cream, his face stoic. Ha! Huh. Melissa said, looking at Tony in surprise. She quickly turned towards All Might with tears in her eyes. Is it true? Are you dying? I'm not dying, Blurg. All Might said before coughing up blood and, with a puff of smoke, transformed into a skeletal figure, a complete 180 from his usual appearance. Ah! You are dying! Melissa screamed in fright. All Might wiped the blood from his bony chin. Damn it! It appears my time has shortened again. He mumbled before sighing and looking towards Tony and Melissa. Tony continued to eat his ice cream while Melissa was bawling her eyes out, crying for him not to die. I wanted to explain before showing you this, but it appears the time I can maintain my figure has shortened, All Might briefly explained. He then turned towards the relaxed Tony and asked, How did you know? I knew since the first day I met you, Tony explained, tapping the side of his glasses. You should know me by now, old man. These aren't just for show. They detected your injury. I see. All Might nodded in understanding. Injury? What injury? Melissa asked. Haven't you found it weird that our monthly hangouts mostly last for about 30 minutes to an hour? Tony asked. No, Melissa shook her head. I just assumed since he was the number one hero, he was always busy saving lives and was being kind by spending time with us each month even when he was busy and could have been saving lives. Tony and All Might just stared at her before Tony turned towards All Might. All right, dude. She needs to stop spending time with you. She's catching your idiot disease. What injury were you two talking about? Melissa interrupted, not wanting the subject to change. All Might lifted his shirt and showed his damaged stomach. Melissa looked at it, horrified. H, how are you even alive? Sheer freaking will, Tony said as he licked his ice cream. Language, young Stark, All Might said. Melissa then turned towards Tony. If you knew all along, why didn't you tell me sooner? We could have helped him, we could have come up with a cure, she said with quivering lips and a hurt look. Tony shrugged his shoulders. Because it's not my secret to share. He would have told us when he was ready. All Might nodded. And I can't thank you enough for keeping it a secret, young Stark. Now I know I can safely share more with you without worry. More? Melissa asked as she wiped her tears from her eyes. You see, there's a reason I wanted to meet you too, even if it isn't our usual time to meet. I have another secret, one only a select few friends know. A secret about my quirk. All Might held out his hand as he began to explain, his two large strands of hair blowing back against the wind. Many have speculated about the name of my quirk and what it entails. The name of my quirk is one for all, a quirk that is passed on from one user to the next. Ha! Huh. Melissa exclaimed in utter shock. Is such a quirk even possible? Melissa, remember my rule in science? Melissa nodded with a serious expression and calmed down. Anything is possible if you believe it to be. Melissa then looked towards All Might, awaiting his next words. My master passed my quirk on to me which was passed on by her master and so on. I am currently the eighth holder of one for all. The reason I am sharing this with you is that I want you, Melissa, to be the ninth. Melissa looked bewildered as she pointed to herself. Me, she shouted before looking towards Tony, who was still calmly licking his ice cream. All Might nodded. I have known you since you were just a tiny child. I can see the fine woman you are becoming. You always want to help people. You, Melissa, have the heart of a hero and I couldn't have chosen a better candidate for the next one for all user. Melissa looked pressured by the burden before looking at Tony for help. Seeing her look, Tony sighed. Melissa, I'm sorry, but I can't help you make this decision. I can't always make the decisions for you, Melissa. You have to learn how to make decisions on your own. Just know that no matter what you choose, I will always have your back. Melissa took a deep breath to calm herself down. You're right. I'm sorry. This is something for me to decide. All Might nodded. This is why I shared this secret with young Stark as well. Melissa looked down at her feet, closed her eyes, and began to think about everything. 
She turned towards Tony once more, remembering the first time they met and her life that followed. She exhaled sharply, her shoulders slumping, before looking up with a large smile. Uncle might I... Melissa paused dramatically before crossing her arms. Decline. All Might was surprised upon hearing her answer, and even Tony was a little shocked. May I ask why? All Might asked with a confused look. As vice president of the honorary corkless club, I can't possess a cork. Sorry. Melissa shrugged before looking towards Tony with a large smile. Corkless club? All Might asked. Lost. Tony's mouth was slightly open. You still remember that? Tony then looked towards All Might and briefly explained, When we first met and became friends, I made a joke about welcoming her to the Corkless Club. Are you sure, Melissa? All Might asked. Melissa nodded with a serious expression. I thought about it and having a cork would definitely help me become a hero and save people. But thanks to someone, I realized a cork isn't what makes someone a hero. It's their actions. So I won't need it. Once again, sorry, Uncle Might. All Might sighed and scratched the back of his head. I honestly didn't expect to be rejected. I thought, since you were corkless, you would have instantly agreed. All Might then turned towards Tony. And I take it it would be a pointless endeavor to ask you as well? Yup, Tony said, popping the P. Just like the number two hero, your actions would be pointless. Oh, what a burn, Melissa said covering her mouth playfully. Tony pointed towards her. Nice. Thank you. It looks like I'll have to consider Nizu's offer. All Might muttered quietly. Now that all of this is out of the way, when can you come by my lab? Tony asked as he finished his ice cream. All Might looked at him in confusion. For what reason? Tony rolled his eyes. Did you really think I just sat around with the information of your injury while you waited to tell us? I already developed the procedure to cure you of your injury. So when can you come by? Really? Melissa asked excitedly. Tony nodded. I can synthesize the body parts you need and cure you of your poison whenever you are ready. Are you being serious, young Stark? All Might asked in surprise. You think I made Stark Industries the way it is by just sitting around and lying about my products? I suppose not. You have always been exceptionally brilliant. All Might admitted. Can I bring a friend along? All Might asked. Who? And why? Tony asked. It's the principal of the UA. Hero Course. He's someone who has helped me a lot. He has used his many connections to find a way to heal me. He even recommended I go to Stark Industries due to their cybernetics, saying they would most likely have a way to help me. Why didn't you? Melissa asked with a hard gaze. All Might sighed. Because, despite being the number one hero, I was afraid. Afraid that, if I showed any vulnerability, it would shatter the image people had of me. I didn't want to let anyone down. But over time, I realized that pretending to be invincible was only making things worse. Principal Nizu has always been there, quietly supporting me and urging me to seek the help I needed. I owe it to him to finally accept that help and show that even the strongest heroes can't do everything alone. Tony nodded. Very well. When will you be coming? Tomorrow, if you don't mind. Tony smiled as he looked towards Melissa. So what do you think, secretary? Is tomorrow all right for me? Do I have anything planned? Melissa smirked back before putting a finger on her chin and pretending to ponder. I don't know. You do have a few meetings and interviews to do, but I think I can push them back a few days, she teased. Tony nodded before looking at All Might with a smirk. Well, look at that. It looks like I do have room for you tomorrow. All Might chuckled at their antics before smiling warmly at them. Thank you. Thank me when I heal you, Tony said before turning around and heading home. Melissa waved goodbye to All Might before running after Tony and jumping on his back. All Might continued to smile as he watched Tony carry Melissa on his back. Third person's POV. The next day... Tony was seen in his lab, arranging everything in order for his visitor, who would be arriving any minute now. The cases holding his suits were all obscured, making it impossible to see what was inside them. Sir, your guest has arrived. They are waiting for you by the front door, Friday informed Tony. All right, I'll be right there, Tony said as he made his way towards the main entrance of his mansion. 
When he opened the door, there stood a buff all might in his iconic stance. I am here, and I brought a guest. Perched on All Might's shoulders was a small white bear-like creature, which Tony immediately recognized as Principal Nizu, hitching a ride. Hello, Nizu greeted before jumping down and extending his hand. Pa, Tony shook it with a nod as he greeted him back. I have to say I'm a big fan of your work. At such a young age, you have more accomplishments under your belt than any starting hero, Nizu said, smiling. Let's not wait any longer, shall we? Come, follow me. I have everything ready, Tony said as he led them toward the lab. I'll give you guys a tour after we're done with the surgery, Tony added as he gestured for them to follow him. Confused, they watched as Tony sat down at the piano. Well, get closer, you guys are out of range. They moved closer and Tony began to play the Avengers theme. Nizu couldn't help but laugh while letting out little squeaks between chuckles. This wasn't something I was expecting, Nizu commented. They were shocked to see Tony's futuristic lab with holograms floating around. Melissa appeared wearing a nurse uniform, complete with a mask and gloves, ready to assist. Come and follow me, Tony instructed as he walked through his lab, passing by a door before turning a corner and entering another room. They arrived at what looked like a medical bay, with a large bed and screen devices on the side. Inside the room, there was another door labeled Disinfectant Room, which Tony led Principal Nizu into. Melissa followed, with All Might looking around nervously. After a few minutes, a slimmed-down All Might emerged wearing patient garb, while Nizu and Tony came out dressed in blue surgeon outfits with caps, masks, and gloves. Surprisingly, another figure emerged with them, Baymax, round and soft as a marshmallow, also dressed in a surgical outfit. I don't quite understand. Why am I dressed up as well? Nizu asked awkwardly, looking down at himself. In case you need to touch something, Melissa informed him. I was looking for a more thorough explanation, Nizu said with a puzzled expression. Well, you'll be present, right? I assumed you'd want to be here, Tony replied. I thought I'd be observing behind a glass window that shows inside the room, Nizu added. Hearing that, both Tony and Melissa froze momentarily. Seeing their reaction, Nizu chuckled. Did you guys forget that was an option? Tony cleared his throat. No, no more questions, please. All Might looked at Nizu with concern before Tony guided him to the large bed. On one of the screens, a complete image of All Might's insides was displayed. Seriously, how the hell are you still alive? Tony muttered as he examined the image in front of him. Even I'm beginning to question that myself, young Stark, All Might replied, studying the images showing his severely damaged stomach, liver, and the toxic residue. As I mentioned before, I've already secretly examined you. The poison is a highly advanced compound, a combination of biotoxins and some form of dark energy residue. Whoever designed this knew exactly how to attack both your physical and metaphysical aspects. Is there a cure for it? Nizu asked. Nope, Tony said, popping the pea. Whoever made this ensured there was no cure whatsoever. Huh? But didn't you say you have a way to help him? Nizu said, narrowing his eyes at Tony. And I do. We won't be curing it, but we will be removing it. What are you planning? Nizu asked curiously. Friday, display a holographic image of All Might's body. Please, as the image appeared, Tony grabbed the damaged part of All Might, removed it and threw it in the trash. Then, he retrieved a replacement part seemingly out of nowhere and inserted it into the empty space. We're basically remaking the damaged parts of his body, Tony explained. He isn't a machine where you can just replace whatever part is broken, Nizu said with displeasure. Tony rolled his eyes. Relax, he'll be in cryogenic sleep where his body will be completely still. We'll remove all the damaged parts and replace them with synthesized organs, stomach, liver, muscle fiber, veins, and skin. Tony continued explaining how they would use All Might's DNA from each part as a basis for a perfect match. After everything was explained, Nizu looked at Tony and said, If you wanted to, you could create a functional human body. Couldn't you? I could, but it would be just a husk. I don't have the power to manipulate souls. And honestly, I don't want to create one. Why? 
You could have an army if you wanted, Nezu remarked. Because I was raised right? What kind of stupid question is that? I thought you were supposed to be smart, Tony retorted. Nezu chuckled. That's the first time I've heard such an answer. All right, I'll choose to trust you. For now. Yes, thanks. Your trust means so much to me, Tony said sarcastically, then turned towards All Might. You ready, old man? Ready as I'll ever be, I suppose, All Might muttered. Great answer, Tony nodded. Baymax, turn off his lights. Baymax walked towards the light switch on the wall and flicked it off. I mean, put him under anesthesia, Tony shouted. Tony then heard Baymax's footsteps, causing him to sigh. Baymax, turn the lights back on and then put him under anesthesia. Baymax's footsteps stopped, and it turned around to switch the lights back on before returning to All Might. Is it too late to change my mind? All Might asked. Yes, Tony said as a needle extended from Baymax's thumb and injected All Might. A few seconds later, All Might started going under. You did that on purpose, didn't you? Mizu said with a straight face. Yes, Tony replied shortly. All right, Friday, activate cryogenic sleep, Tony instructed. Soon, glass began to appear from the sides, covering the top of the bed to form a capsule. All right, Baymax, you know what to do. Tony instructed a few minutes later as All Might began to turn pale due to the cold. And just like that, Tony and Baymax began their work. They placed their hands into a compartment of the capsule, their hands showing inside, touching All Might. Little by little, they began to remove all of All Might's damaged parts. Due to his cryogenic state, no blood escaped his body as it remained frozen. Tony then collected the DNA of the damaged parts and placed it inside a vial before inserting it into a machine stationed on one of the desks. The machine functioned like a 3D printer, using the energy from the arc reactor to print living tissues. Little by little, they began the reconstruction of the parts they had removed, making All Might as good as new. Nizu watched everything with extreme fascination. Melissa stood by with a towel, wiping Tony's sweat. After it was all over, Tony asked, Friday, give me a diagnostic of his vitals. Apart from his slow heartbeat due to his cryosleep, all of All Might's vitals are within normal parameters. The newly printed tissues have integrated successfully with his existing cells. There are no signs of the poison remaining in his system. How many hours did that take? Tony inquired. Twelve hours, sir. Tony nodded before saying, You can begin to take him out of cryosleep. Anything else to report? Due to constantly being poisoned and having to survive for so long, his vitality is low. This means he can only transform into All Might for 15 hours. Afterward, he will need to take a break. Any more, and he will begin to harm his body, Friday informed them. Tony nodded and turned towards Nizu. Did you hear that? Make sure he doesn't push himself more than necessary. Nizu nodded seriously and bowed his head towards Tony. You have saved Japan's greatest treasure. Others may not know, but I do, and for that, you will have my gratitude. Dude, chill. I'm just doing what I'm supposed to. Tony waved him off. Confused, Nizu looked at him, prompting Tony to elaborate. I'm going to be a hero in the future. I'm just doing what heroes do. Saving lives, Melissa, who had been watching everything, smiled, her gaze turning soft. Tony's lack of quirk wasn't a big secret, so almost everyone knew about it. Nizu hearing this from him caused his eyes to widen slightly before he smiled. He offered Tony his hand, then I hope to see you at UA. In the coming years, Tony shook his hand, scoffing. I expect the red carpet. Nizu chuckled at that, and a few minutes later, All Might awakened. He was back and as strong as ever. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were seen on an airplane back to Japan after they spent Melissa's 14th birthday party with their family. Melissa was slightly pouty as she looked out the window, ignoring Tony. Tony, Seeing how Melissa was ignoring him, rolled his eyes. Are you really that mad I didn't get you a birthday present? Tony teased. Oomph, she said, turning her head further away. I would have been fine with even a birthday card, she muttered. There's a reason I haven't given you your present yet. It's back home, Tony continued to tease. 
Melissa looked towards Tony in confusion. What? What is it? Melissa asked curiously. Oh, now you want to talk to me? Melissa just looked down as she pressed her fingers together. It's just you didn't seem to care much about my birthday, so I was worried. Tony rolled his eyes before smirking and interrupting her sentence. Just wait till we get back home. Then we will see if I care enough. Melissa nodded her head and kept trying to guess what Tony had gotten her. Tony just denied all her guesses until they landed. It took them about an hour before they arrived back at his lab. Come, follow me. When they made it to the center of his underground lab, they found a large box wrapped in wrapping paper with a large red ribbon on it. What is it? Melissa asked as she looked at the side. Why don't you open it? Tony said as he sat down on his chair and spun around. Melissa walked towards the large box, pulled on the ribbon, and moved out of the way as all four sides came down, revealing the inside of the box. It was a beautiful blue Iron Man suit, clearly designed for a woman, specifically for Melissa. She looked at it with widened eyes and saw that there was a note taped to its chest where the arc reactor was. She reached for it and read the front. For Melissa Shield, happy birthday, my little secretary. From the greatest mind this world has ever seen, she chuckled and scoffed. You're even arrogant on your birthday card. Typical. She then opened it and read the letter inside. I know you wanted to go to the tech department at UA. But I think that is a waste of your potential. All Might had once said it as well. You have the heart of a hero. So why not become one? Join the UA. Hero course with me since after all, every Iron Man needs his Iron Maiden. Melissa looked towards Tony with quivering lips and teary eyes. Tony. Is this a proposal? Ha! Huh. Tony asked, taken aback by the question. If I didn't know any better, I would have thought you were proposing to me. What? Especially this line here, every Iron Man needs his Iron Maiden. Tony started to stutter, taken aback by how she was interpreting it. What I meant was, I didn't mean it like that. Tony began to blush. Melissa giggled as she went and wrapped her arms around Tony. I'm only pulling your leg, Tony. Thank you. Tony let out a sigh of relief. Don't worry about it. So what do you think? Melissa wiped her tears before nodding her head. All right, I'll join you. I'll be your Iron Maiden, she said in a teasing tone. Please stop saying it like that, Tony said, still embarrassed, which caused Melissa to giggle. Why don't you try it on, Tony said, changing the subject. Melissa nodded and walked towards the suit of armor. When she put a hand on the arc reactor, the suit opened up, exposing its inside to her, almost like an invitation. Melissa put her back towards it, and the suit closed like a door. She heard some things locking and spinning into place before turning on. She then heard Friday's voice, retinal scan complete. Welcome aboard, Melissa Shield. All systems are fully operational. Still as cool as the first day I put on your suit, Melissa said with a large smile as she examined her hands while opening and closing her fists. Tony smiled as he watched Melissa enjoy herself. She turned her head towards him and said, Come on, put on your suit. I don't want to fly alone. Tony smirked as he put his index and thumb in his mouth and whistled. Melissa watched as one of the cases with a red and silver Iron Man suit opened. Its eyes glowed to life and it began walking toward Tony. Tony spread his arms as he stood up and walked back. The suit mirrored his movements, opening its arms. The front of the suit then split open, ready for him. With a fluid motion, Tony stepped into the suit, closed around him, bolting shut with a series of clicks and whirs. Friday, open the window, Tony commanded. The window leading to the beach outside slid upwards. Tony turned to Melissa, a playful grin on his face. After you, my lady, he teased. Melissa smirked and activated her thrusters. She soared out the window, her suit systems humming with power. Tony followed close behind, his suit a blur of red and silver. Once outside, Melissa's voice came through the comms. What mark is my suit, Tony? A FaceTime screen popped up in her HUD, showing Tony's face. Yours is Mark 24. Mine's 23, Tony replied. Figures, Melissa said, good-naturedly. They soared over the coastline, 
performing intricate maneuvers. Melissa tested her suit's weapon systems, firing repulsor blasts into the ocean. Tony demonstrated the suit's ability to withstand high-velocity impacts by diving into the water and rocketing back out with ease. Let's test the uni-beam, Tony suggested. Melissa nodded, aiming at a distant rock formation. The suit's chest plate opened slightly, and a powerful beam of energy shot out, disintegrating the target. Wow, that packs a punch, Melissa said, impressed. Try the flares, Tony instructed. Melissa deployed a series of flares from her suit, watching as they ignited and spread out, creating a brilliant display of light. These will come in handy against heat-seeking missiles, Tony explained. They flew higher, testing the suit's altitude capabilities. Activate stealth mode, Tony commanded. Their suits shimmered, blending into the sky until they were nearly invisible. This is incredible, Melissa whispered, admiring the camouflage effect. Tony smiled through the HUD. Just wait. Let's try the emergency medical protocols next. Melissa simulated a critical system failure, watching as her suit immediately administered a painkiller and deployed a medical diagnostic display. This could come in handy, she noted, impressed by the suit's emergency response capabilities. All right, now for something fun, Tony said, deactivating stealth mode. Engage combat training simulation, their HUDs filled with virtual targets and obstacles. They weaved through the sky, taking down simulated drones and avoiding energy blasts. Melissa's movements became more fluid as she adjusted to the suit's responsiveness. How's your targeting system? Tony asked. Spot on, Melissa replied, hitting every mark with precision. Let's test the suit's AI interface, Tony suggested. Friday, initiate tactical analysis. Friday's voice came through both their comms. Tactical analysis initiated. Assessing threats and providing optimal combat strategies. Their HUDs displayed strategic overlays, highlighting potential threats and suggesting countermeasures. They followed the AI's guidance, executing maneuvers with precision. As the sun began to set, they hovered above the ocean, their suits casting long shadows on the water below. Thanks for this, Tony, Melissa said sincerely. Tony smiled. Anytime. Now, race you back to the lab. You're on. Melissa laughed. And with that, they both took off, streaking back toward the shore in a blur of blue and silver. Third person's POV. One month later, Melissa was working on her suit, wearing a large metal mask as she used a blowtorch. She then heard Friday relay a message through the entire lab. A message from All Might. Please come to the beach where I told you all my secret. There is something I have to show you both. Melissa turned to look towards Tony, who seemed to be in a state where he ignored everything around him as he focused on his suit. He was wearing a similar outfit to hers, a black tank top that showed all the results of his years of exercise and hard work. His skin was dirted by grease, which should have diminished his appearance, but to Melissa, it added to his appeal, and she couldn't help but stare. After a while, she shook her head and walked towards Tony, tapping him on the shoulder. What is it? He asked as he lifted his mask. Uncle Might wants to meet us. He sent us a message. Melissa informed him before going over to change. As she walked away, Tony stared in her direction, realizing what she was wearing. He couldn't help but shake his head. Puberty is one hell of a bitch, he muttered. Friday, send a message over that we will meet All Might in a few. Tony said as he went to a different place to get changed. When they got out of their car, Melissa turned towards Tony and asked, What do you think he wants to show us? If I had to guess, he finally found a wife to settle down with and retire, Tony teased. Melissa chuckled. I'm being serious here, and so am I, Tony said, clearly lying. When they walked down a few stone steps and reached the beach, they found All Might standing next to a boy around their age. The only difference was that he was as skinny as a twig, with green hair and freckles. Are you serious? He still got chosen as a successor. Just wow, so that's the MC Izuka Midoriya, Tony thought to himself. When they arrived, Midoriya started to freak out. He turned towards All Might. You didn't say that the friend we were waiting for was the great Anthony Stark. Midoriya did a 90-degree bow while extending his hands. Hello, I'm Izuku Midoriya. 
Pleased to meet you. I'm a very big fan. Tony looked at him weirdly as he shook his hand. You are. Midoriya rapidly nodded his head before becoming shy. He had a small, self-deprecating smile as he said, You see, I was also born without a cork. Melissa nudged Tony's side. A new member of our corkless club. Perhaps. Midoriya looked at them in confusion before continuing. So seeing someone who is also corkless do so much and help heroes all over Japan is a really big inspiration to me. Who is he, Uncle Might? Melissa finally asked. Uncle Might? Midoriya wondered. All Might laughed happily as he patted Midoriya's back. This right here is my successor, he said proudly. Melissa and Tony looked at Midoriya's skinny frame before looking towards All Might, then back at Midoriya. They both just sighed as they facebombed. Seeing how they were judging him, Midoriya looked down in shame. Why did you choose him? Melissa asked. Ha ha ha. Even though he was corkless, he rushed into danger to save his friend. All Might's words were interrupted by Tony, who pulled out his phone. Friday, show us. Tony demanded as a hologram appeared above the phone. Melissa and Tony watched how Midoriya ran through a crowd of people and threw his backpack towards a sludge monster, hitting it in the eyes, exactly as it happened in the series. When I asked why he did that, he said that his legs moved on their own, which are truly the markings of a great hero, All Might explained. Melissa nodded. At least he has guts, but isn't he a bit too skinny? Not to mention the entrance exams for UA are in 10 months. Scanning complete. Hearing this, Melissa and All Might turned towards the sound, where they found Tony had finished scanning Midoriya. Tell me, did you always want to be a hero? Tony asked. Midoriya nodded his head with a serious expression. You could have fooled me. Honestly, if you wanted to be a hero, why didn't you train the only thing you did have? Your body. I, I don't. Forget it. Tony shook his head. First things first. Stop being such a pussy. Young Stark. All Might reprimanded. Melissa sighed as she covered her face. Midoriya was taken aback. Ha! Huh, you heard me. You are going to be All Might's successor. Being pussy doesn't suit it. Young Stark. Please stop using such foul language. All Might pleaded. Tony then looked at the scan. Let's see here. No diseases. No heart condition. No diabetes. No asthma. No muscle defect. You are perfectly normal, which means you have no excuse not to have exercised. Midoriya just looked down in shame. You know, you remind me of someone. Someone I kind of look up to, Tony said. Melissa looked at him weirdly, since the only person Tony could have possibly looked up to was himself. I'm pretty sure he was older than you by a few years, but he was 5 feet 4 inches and weighed no more than 90 pounds. He was pure bones, too. He had asthma, scoliosis, heart arrhythmia, partial deafness, stomach ulcers, and pernicious anemia. They were looking at Tony, intrigued and questioning where he was going with this. It was during a time of war, so he wanted to be a soldier, but not because he wanted to fight the opposite side. He wanted to help his countrymen. During a time of war, he didn't want to fight. He wanted to protect. Tony then looked at All Might. His heart of gold captured the eyes of a scientist who had a way to help him and make him strong. It was, let's say, a serum. All that serum did was enhance the person. If the person was good, it enhanced the good. If the person was evil, it enhanced the evil. There were multiple soldiers he could have chosen, soldiers that were strong, healthy, in all technicality a better option due to their position in the war. But the scientist chose him out of everyone. He helped enlist that skeletal man into the army, where he failed practically every test they threw at him, except for the test of wits and character. Tony saw that they were all looking at him with burning curiosity, wondering what would happen next. Then it came time to administer the serum. As they were administering it, the spies that were present during the presentation killed the scientist who created the serum. But the serum was already administered, and he had turned into a specimen of a man. He had turned into the ultimate super soldier. And so began his saga of how he started fighting in the war. He went into enemy lines, rescued captured soldiers. He always charged recklessly into battle if it meant saving someone. Melissa interrupted as she pointed to Midoriya. I see, so in this scenario, Midoriya Kuin is the weak, pathetic, skeletal. Melissa, that's enough. 
You're killing him, Tony teased, imagining what it would be like if this were an anime, with arrows made out of words stabbing through Midoriya. Midoriya is the soldier, and Uncle Might is the scientist in this story. No, sure, let's go with that. Basically, what I was trying to say with all of that is that you were chosen compared to everyone else for a reason. Although I don't even know you I can already tell how you are, don't doubt yourself. Midoriya and All Might then felt their phones buzz. There is a training routine and the plans for a proper diet for him to follow if he wants to get stronger quickly and build muscle based on his physique. Follow it. I never gave him my number, Midoriya thought to himself. And All Might, yes, you are the number one hero which means you are rich. Use it to buy the proper training equipment and train him properly. That's all the help I am offering, Tony said as he turned around and started walking away. Bye, Uncle Might. And it was nice to meet you, Midoriya Kuin, Melissa said as she followed after Tony. Why are you leaving in such a hurry? Melissa asked. Tony didn't respond to her. Instead, he spoke to his phone. Friday, make a new file, code name. The Super Soldier Serum, third person's POV. Five months later, Tony was in the lab with a stylus in hand. All right, attempt 208, replace potassium nitrate with lithium carbonate then substitute sodium chloride with magnesium sulfate. Let's try a synthesized peptide chain instead of the traditional amino acids. How about replacing titanium dioxide with graphene oxide? And let's experiment with cobalt nanoparticles instead of iron nanoparticles. Let's see what happens if we use a carbon nanotube matrix instead of a polymer matrix. Replace sulfuric acid with hydrochloric acid and swap out silver nanoparticles for gold nanoparticles. Let's switch from a hydrogel carrier to a lipid nanoparticle carrier. And finally, let's replace polyethylene glycol with polyvinyl alcohol. Friday, initiate simulations for all these substitutions. Now running simulations. Are you still on this, Tony? Melissa asked with a sigh. Yup, Tony nodded. You are literally trying to create something you just completely made up in your head. Melissa sighed. Isn't that what all inventions are? Tony asked, looking at her like she was an idiot. Melissa rolled her eyes. And I thought we had this whole pact about no superpowers? This isn't a superpower. This is evolution. Think of it like unlocking the peak of what a normal human can reach. We are only gaining access to what we already possess. But still, didn't you just make the story up to motivate Midoriya? Why are you more fascinated with your story than he is? Because if I thought of it, then that must have been for a reason, Tony said smugly. Simulations complete. Congratulations, sir. Everything is showing as intended. We can now begin production. Huh? Both Melissa and Tony said as they looked towards the monitor in complete surprise. Melissa then turned towards Tony. Why the hell are you surprised? You created it. Tony scratched his cheek. I thought it would have taken me longer. I'm not gonna lie. Well, that was easy. You are so unbelievable. Tony, I swear. Ah, thanks, Tony said with a touched expression. So, are you going to just make it and take it? Yup, Tony nodded. But it's not just for me. It's for the both of us. Tony, are you sure that thing is safe? Melissa asked, worried. Yes. Want to know why? Why? Because I created it. Honestly, I've known you for so long that what you just said is actually a valid argument. You know what? Let's do it. Since you trust your invention so much, I'm not backing down. Let's take it together. At a girl, Tony said. Friday, make an order for all the things we will need. 30 minutes later, Baymax walked down with a parcel in hand and handed it to Tony. Tony then began with its creation. The reason it took Tony so long to make was that he had to make it from scratch, not to mention he adjusted it so it didn't have the need for radiation. Just accepting it into your bloodstream would be more than enough. Two vials were inside a machine in front of him, shaking around, turning into a blur. Tony watched how the liquid inside turned from a dark red color to an ocean blue. Ding! Tony grabbed the vials and put them inside another apparatus, which just appeared to be a syringe gun. Tony handed the gun to Melissa. Ready? Tony, if I die, I'm haunting you down as a ghost, Melissa said flatly. Joke's on you. 
I'ma be dead alongside you, Tony said as he injected the serum into his veins, which Melissa soon followed. Their veins started to turn a bright blue color. The color began to spread through all of their veins, even showing on their necks. They gritted their teeth as their eyes widened before they collapsed on the floor. Baymax appeared before both of them. He picked them both up and put them to sleep in their beds. A few hours later, Tony woke up with sweat everywhere, his clothes sticking to him, his hair wet and messy. First of all, why Yusuke? You know what? I'm rich. I don't have to deal with broke people problems. Friday. Throw away my entire bed and get me a new one while I shower. As Tony got out of bed, he looked at his arms. Oh, daddy is liking how his arms are looking. And the rest of me too. Tony went to his bathroom and took off all his wet clothes. Meanwhile, Melissa was having a shower as well. She was washing her long blonde hair. I've grown taller. I hope I don't look too weird. She muttered until she heard Tony laughing loudly from his side of the room. Ha 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 ha. Holy shit. My cock is massive. Melissa grew bright red and covered her face. She had to crouch down as the water hit her due to the embarrassment she was feeling. Does he have zero shame? Oh, who am I kidding? Of course he has no shame, but he should at least have some decency. After Tony finished his shower, he dried off and got changed. Luckily for him, most of his clothes were made from unstable molecule fibers, so they fit him perfectly no matter what size he was. Tony got dressed in a black tight long sleeve shirt, black sweatpants with his ankles exposed, and black sneakers. He spiked his straight hair up with his fingers and nodded his head as he looked at himself in his mirror. I just grow sexier by the minute, don't I? And with that, Tony headed back down to his lab where he found Melissa, and for the first time, Tony could finally say he had been mesmerized. Her blonde hair was slightly curly while her black glasses hung loosely by the bridge of her nose. Her lips a beautiful red color as she wore a black wool sweater. Tony had to blink a few times before shaking his head out of it. You were still wearing your glasses. Melissa, realizing Tony had arrived, looked towards him and froze as she looked him up and down. I am. Um, I don't need them. But they have the HUD, which is helpful. Ah, okay. Tony said a bit awkwardly. You look good. Melissa blushed. So do you... Shall we test our enhancements? Tony asked, quickly changing the subject. Melissa nodded, the first thing they tried out was their strength. They walked over to their gym room where they would normally exercise. They went to a weight bench that had been specially reinforced for their tests on the Iron Man suit. Let's start with a simple bench press, Tony suggested. He added weights to the bar, stacking it up to 500 pounds. Melissa laid down on the bench, gripped the bar, and with a smooth motion, pressed it up without much effort. This is incredible, she said, her eyes wide with amazement. Tony smiled and added another 200 pounds, bringing the total to 700 pounds. Melissa managed to press it up again, though with a bit more effort this time. I think I can go higher, she said, a determined look on her face. Tony added another 100 pounds, bringing the total to 800 pounds. Melissa took a deep breath and pressed the bar up again, her arms shaking slightly but still managing to complete the lift. That's my limit, I think, she said, lowering the bar back to the rack with a sigh of relief. Tony took his turn next, starting with the same 800 pounds. He managed to lift it with slightly more ease than Melissa, then added another 100 pounds, bringing the total to 900 pounds. He pressed it up, his face showing strain, but still managing to complete the lift. I think that's my limit too, he said, lowering the bar back to the rack. Next, they moved on to testing their speed. They went towards a treadmill and both of them began to run. Tony reached a total of 120 miles per hour, 193.1 kilometers per hour, while Melissa reached 110 miles per hour, 177 kilometers per hour. Finally, they tested their reflexes using a series of automated drones that fired soft projectiles at them. Both Tony and Melissa moved with blinding speed, dodging and deflecting the projectiles with almost superhuman reflexes. After the tests, they both sat down, catching their breath. I can't believe how much we've improved, Melissa said, her face flushed with excitement. Tony nodded in agreement, 
It's incredible. I'm so freaking awesome. They both then began to laugh together as they leaned against each other. Third person's POV. Five more months had quickly passed. During these months, Tony and Melissa had met up with All Might and Midoriya on a few occasions. Due to the diet plans and training exercises Tony had provided, Midoriya had grown more muscular than he was originally supposed to be, not to mention a bit taller as well. But the thing that shocked Tony the most was Midoriya's improved confidence. When Tony asked how that happened, Midoriya said it was thanks to his story about the soldier. It made him realize that among everyone in the world, All Might had chosen him as his successor. Meanwhile, All Might was surprised by Tony's and Melissa's transformation. When Tony mentioned constantly training for the upcoming exams mixed with puberty, All Might bought it hook, line, and sinker. Now it was time for the entrance exams. Melissa and Tony were running around their mansion, scurrying for their things. Do you have everything? Tony asked Melissa. Melissa lifted a blue briefcase up towards Tony. Yes, they both then felt their phones buzz. When they checked, it was an image All Might had sent them. A skinny Midoriya next to how he looks now. It made them smile at his transformation. Sir, Ms. Yayorozu is waiting for you both at the front. Friday informed them. Tony and Melissa rushed out with excited expressions and entered the limo that Momo had opened for them. You two seem very excited. She teased as she and Melissa hugged and gave a side kiss. If I remember correctly, you were also like this during your recommendation exams, Tony said with a smirk. Did you receive the results yet? Melissa asked. Momo shook her head. It looks like we will all get the results together. It didn't take them long to arrive at UA. When they arrived, they looked towards Momo and smiled. Thanks for showing your support, Melissa said. Momo just giggled. What are you talking about? I'm just making sure you all finish this quickly so we can all be UA. Students together. Good luck out there, you guys. Thanks, they both said as they exited the limo. As it drove off, they stood watching UA. With their briefcases in hand, Tony held his casually over his shoulder, while Melissa held hers with both hands in front of her. They looked at each other and smiled before they began to walk forward towards their destination. They found Midoriya by the entrance, mumbling to himself. They were about to call out to him when he suddenly took a step forward and ended up tripping on his own two feet. A girl with short brown hair put her hand on his back and stopped him before fixing him back up. She put her hands together and Midoriya landed back on the ground. Instead of wrapping his face with his arms and blushing like a madman, he just rubbed the back of his head and began talking to the girl, who Tony knew was Eurarika. Midoriya awkwardly laughed as the girl just giggled before waving goodbye. What the hell am I witnessing? Tony thought to himself as he walked behind Midoriya and slapped his back, startling him. Wah! Oh, it's just you, Tony. Don't you Oh, it's just you, me. What the hell was that? Since when do you know how to flirt? Tony asked, looking at him weirdly. Midoriya looked at him in confusion, unsure of what he was talking about. Melissa shook her head. Ignore him. Let's go inside. The written exam is about to begin. They were all separated into different rooms where they were sat down and handed sheets of paper with questions. All of the questions were academic until the last one. Why do you want to become a hero? Tony smiled as he looked at the question and began to write. He even chuckled at the answer he gave. Afterwards, they were led to an auditorium where they were debriefed on the practical exam. Tony and Melissa sat together, with Midoriya seated a few seats across with a boy who had spiky sandy blonde hair. Tony smiled as he saw President Mike walk to the stage. Welcome to today's live performance. Everyone say hey. President Mike said as he cupped his ears towards everyone. H-E-Y. Both Tony and Melissa shouted back before they began to chuckle and giggle between themselves. Thank you. You two random test takers. President Mike cheered. Now then, I'm here to present the guidelines of your practical exam. Are you guys ready? Hell yeah. Tony and Melissa shouted back. Now everyone was looking at them weirdly. A boy with short blue hair and glasses was glaring at them with extreme displeasure. Tony and Melissa didn't care. They just watched as Midoriya started fangirling over President Mike before being told to shut up. This is how the test will go, my listeners. 
you'll be experiencing 10-minute long mock cityscape maneuvers. Bring along whatever you want. After this presentation, you'll each head to your assigned testing location. I see, so we won't be able to help each other. That's good, Melissa nodded. Tony nodded right back. This way, we can finally compete properly and it won't end in a tie. Melissa just looked at him and smirked in amusement. Each site is filled with three kinds of faux villains. Points are awarded for defeating each according to their respective difficulty levels. Use your quirks to disable these faux villains and earn points. That's your goal, listeners. Of course, playing the anti-hero and attacking other examinees is prohibited. The boy, whom Tony identified as Ida, who had been glaring at Tony and Melissa earlier, rose up and lifted a hand holding a sheet they were given about the practical exam. There appear to be no fewer than four faux villains in this handout. Such a blatant error, if it is one, is highly unbecoming for UA, Japan's top school. We are all here today in the hopes of being molded into model heroes. Ida turned around and pointed towards Tony and Melissa. And you too. This isn't a game. We are here to be... Snore. Tony yelled as he grabbed his sunglasses, putting them on and throwing his head back, not paying attention. Ida grew red in the face at such blatant disrespect. You, you, he was simply at a loss for words. All right, all right. Examinee 7111. That was a good catch. Thank you. But the fourth faux villain variety gets you zero points. He's more of an obstacle. Have you all played Super Mario Brothers? The old retro game. It's kind of like a thwomp. Only one at each site. A gimmick. That'll rampage around in close quarters. After Ida gave his thanks for the explanation, Present Mike continued. That's all for me. I'll leave my listeners with our school motto. The great hero Napoleon Bonaparte once said, True heroism consists in being superior to the ills of life. Present Mike took a deep breath. Plus Ultraea. Break a leg, everyone. Tony and Melissa looked at each other and gave large toothy grins. It's time we put on a show, Tony said. And we'll see which one of us had the most impact. Melissa finished. They grabbed their briefcases and began to walk in separate directions. Third person's POV. Tony walked towards his test site, looking at his letter. A. Melissa had C, while Midoriya was taking D. When he arrived, he found people of all different sizes and shapes, all with different quirks. Some looked really nervous. Some looked like they were ready to throw up. No one was even paying much attention to him. To people, he seemed familiar, but their nerves didn't allow them to approach. And begin, present Mike announced. Everything soon grew confused, except for Tony. Tony laid the briefcase down and touched the centerpiece with his thumb. After the scan, the briefcase flipped open, revealing intricate machinery inside, while two large arm handles were raised up. Tony inserted his arms into the handles, twisted them, then lifted the briefcase to his chest. What are you waiting for? The test has begun. Go, 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 present Mike shouted. Everyone began running while Tony continued to suit up. They looked at him a bit weirdly at first but soon ignored him and continued running. If Tony had seen what Melissa was doing, he would have laughed and smiled. They mirrored each other perfectly. Once they brought their armor to their chests, they stretched out their hands while holding the handles. The handles wrapped around their arms before the chest piece started to expand, covering their bodies down to their legs. Their necks began to get covered as chin guards appeared before covering the entirety of their heads, leaving their faces exposed. A mask then emerged from the back of their heads, sliding down to cover their faces. There were many clicks and whirs before their arc reactors glowed, followed by their repulsors and eyes lighting up in tandem. It's showtime, they both said in unison with a light smirk. All of this happened in 10 seconds. In a showroom where many teachers watched, the participants were intrigued by their suit-up sequence. That was so cool, Midnight said in fascination. All Might, who was present, laughed. Young Stark loves to show off, doesn't he? I'm more interested in what they are wearing, Nizu said with eyes beaming with curiosity. What are their quirks? Aizawa asked curiously. Nizu smirked, they're quirkless, 
All of their eyes widened as they saw Tony and Melissa fly off, speeding past everyone. Tony and Melissa stood in the middle of their arena and started sending repulsors flying out from their hands. From their shoulders, a small machine gun appeared, shooting laser bullets toward the faux villains. Is this even allowed? Midnight asked curiously. Mizu nodded. I met with young Stark before. He is exceptionally gifted. Although he doesn't possess a quirk, he is smart enough to make such a piece of art. Here, Mizu said as he handed them a portfolio. I take it this is the same Anthony Stark who is in charge of Stark Industries? Aizawa asked with a straight face. They opened the files and started reading out his achievements. At just 10 years old, he took over Stark Industries stationed in Japan. In just one week, it went from the brink of collapse to becoming one of the top companies selling cybernetics and other different inventions. It has become a company equal to its main building in the U.S., while he became the owner of several Nobel Prizes and awards for different subjects. There are most likely more achievements he has kept hidden from the world and wouldn't like to share, which shows his great insight at such a young age. Why would he want to be a hero? Isn't he like the richest person in the world, technically? If I were his age with that kind of money, becoming a hero would be the least of my concerns, Midnight said as she looked at everything. Read the last page, Mizu said as they watched Tony catch a fallen building a robot created, saving some people below them. They then looked towards Melissa, who stood in front of some people as she used her body as a shield to protect them from the bullets. Isn't this the test they just took? Midnight asked. She then looked at the last question. She couldn't help but chuckle at the answer. She read the question out loud before reading the answer. Why do you want to become a hero? Because my butler said so, he he, what kind of answer is that? They then watched as Tony flew right to one of the robots and didn't stop as he continued flying through them. Aizawa watched everything with a pondering look and narrowed eyes. He looked towards Melissa and watched how she carried people who got themselves injured away and how she provided first aid to them before jumping back to fighting. How long do those suits hold up? What if they don't possess those suits? They will be defenseless without them, Aizawa asked and criticized. But All Might defended them, that isn't true. You are underestimating just how smart they truly are, Aizawa. They are both very special. I just know it. And you are forgetting they are mainly an energy-related company, so I say those suits will hold on for a very long time, Mizu said with a nod. All Might then shifted all of his attention towards Midoriya, watching as he expelled green energy from his body, while he went around helping those in need and destroying as many robots as he could. All Might couldn't help but be proud of how far Midoriya had come. Vlad then turned towards Aizawa, if you don't want them, I will gladly take them into my class. Aizawa scoffed, keep dreaming, they are both coming with me. If they can't keep up with the others, I will expel them without hesitation. I don't care how rich they are. Meanwhile, Tony was slowing down. He flew between buildings and started to only decimate a few of the robots, not all of them, to give the others a fighting chance to get into UA. Tony then had a sudden idea and chuckled to himself. He held his forearm close as part of the armor lifted up, revealing hidden keypads. He immediately took over two of the robots and controlled them to shoot at each other. Power Loader, who was the main person that created those faux villains, looked at them in surprise. Did he just hack them and take the controls away from us? Yes, yes he did, Mizu chuckled. Aizawa just continued to observe everything, taking mental notes of what he was seeing. I think it's time we finish this little exercise, Mizu said with a smirk as he went and pushed a big red button with his little paws. In all the test sites, they heard something large rumbling. A massive green robot appeared, taking down everything in its path. As it moved, buildings were torn down. Tony saw everyone scrambling towards safety, so he landed on the ground with a superhero landing and walked forward between the crowd that was running in fear, pushing everyone aside. Everyone, be mindful of how you are behaving. Pushing people away so you can get to safety isn't the way a hero should be acting, Tony said as he calmly walked towards the calamity. When he got past everyone, he raised a fist. From his wrist, a little rocket appeared before it activated and flew towards the robot. As the tiny rocket embedded itself in the robot, Tony turned around and started walking back towards everyone. 
HTTT, what's the little rocket supposed to do? Midnight started before her question was answered. Boom! As the large explosion occurred and the robot was engulfed in a storm of flames, Tony never once looked back. Those that turned due to the explosion looked back and shook in fear as they watched Tony casually walking towards them with the flames roaring behind him. In the showroom, they all had their mouths agape, unable to believe what they witnessed. Their heads quickly snapped towards Melissa to see if they would witness something similar. Melissa casually floated towards the giant robot while most of them ran away. She crossed her arms over her chest as her chest repulsors charged. She thrust her chest forward as a giant beam of energy escaped from her arc reactor, creating a giant hole through which one could see the other side. The hole was bigger than Melissa's body, and if she wanted, she would have been able to fly through. Melissa smiled as she looked at the destroyed insides, with the outer layer of the hole burning red due to the heat. In the showroom, the teachers were equally as shook. Those suits, I want to examine them, Power Loader said with envy. Vlad turned towards Aizawa, you can at least spare one, can't you? Aizawa just leaned against the wall and closed his eyes, pretending he didn't hear anything. All Might then turned his gaze towards his disciple, watching with great interest. As Midoriya watched the giant robot destroy everything in its path, he saw Eurarika, the girl who had caught him as he fell by the entrance, trapped under some rubble. Midoriya closed his eyes and took a deep breath to calm his nervousness as everyone ran past him. The soldier that runs recklessly into battle to save those in need, he thought to himself as he got into a running stance. Full cowling 5%, he thought as green arcs of electricity escaped from his body due to his excess energy. He let out a groan of pain. I'm only using 5%, but it still feels like my muscle fibers are about to rip. But I can do it. Midoriya ran before jumping up towards the robot. He flexed his arm and threw a punch forward, causing the robot to break and be pushed back. He then quickly realized he didn't make a plan for when he was falling so he helplessly flapped his arms as he fell. Just as he was about to reach the ground, his face was slapped, which took him by surprise. He then realized he was floating in the air and, when he turned, saw Eurarika looking a bit green as she floated with the rubble around her. Midoriya fixed himself as Eurarika joined her hands together with great strain. When they landed back on the ground, Eurarika immediately started to puke. Blurk, are you okay? Midoriya asked with worry. Eurarika, catching her breath, threw a thumbs up. And it's all over. Present mixed voice resounded throughout all the testing sites. Third person's POV. One week later, are you sure you don't want me to hack into UA? I can view our test scores right this instant. Tony asked with a bit of impatience. Tony, the best part about a test is waiting for the results. Plus, I'm sure we did well, so have patience. All good things come to those who wait, Melissa answered calmly. Sir, two letters from UA have arrived in the mail, Friday informed them. Move it, Tony. The acceptance letters are here. Melissa shouted as she pushed Tony out of the way so hard he had to take a few steps back to make sure he wasn't sent flying. Tony rolled his eyes before scoffing. She was probably even more impatient than me and was just putting up a front. Not even a minute passed before Melissa arrived back, waving two letters in the air. They're here, Tony. She handed the one addressed to Tony to him and grabbed hers. They both then went to their respective corners and opened their letters. Out came a disc, and as it activated, a holographic video of All Might in his iconic pose was shown. I am here to give you your results. You performed wonderfully out there, young Stark, Melissa. You managed to impress many of the teachers with your actions. Even though you don't possess a quirk, your actions speak louder than words. At this academy, we don't only test the power you possess. We also test your character. Apart from the number of robots you defeated, you were also graded on the people you saved. These are called rescue points. Here, I'll show you the results of your hard work. All Might said as he pulled out a remote displaying a list of names with scores next to them. I slash N, VP, Villain Points, RP, Rescue Points, 1. Anthony Stark, 111, VP, 
92 RP equals 2032. Melissa Shield, 85 VP, 101 RP equals 186.3. Izuku Midoriya, 29 VP, 71 RP equals 104. Katsuki Bakugo, 77 VP, 0 RP equals 77. Congratulations, Young Stark. You have beaten my record of 197. You are already walking the path of a fantastic hero. All Might said with pride as he took out a party popper and popped it towards the hologram, showering it with confetti. Wah! Tony heard Melissa shouting. When he turned towards her, he saw her running towards him excitedly. He quickly stood up as she jumped into his arms with a large smile. Her smile and excitement were so contagious that Tony couldn't help but smile and laugh as he spun her around in the air. Melissa laughed, her arms resting on his shoulders and around his neck. We're going to be heroes, she said happily. Ha ha ha. I guess we are. They continued chuckling and giggling as they looked at each other. When Tony put her back down, they stared into each other's eyes. Melissa still had her hands on his shoulders and around his neck while Tony held her waist. Their eyes followed the same pattern, looking into each other's eyes before glancing down at their lips. Their lips were like magnets as they slowly moved closer to one another. As they drew closer, they subconsciously closed their eyes until their lips finally connected. After a few seconds, their kissing started to turn more passionate. Melissa's hand moved from Tony's shoulders to his cheek, while her other hand moved to his chest. Tony pulled her waist closer, and Melissa leaned back into his hands that held her waist and back, with both her hands now on his cheek. As their lips pulled away, their foreheads remained pressed together, both breathing a little heavily as they stared into each other's eyes. Melissa blushed bright red, her hands now on his chest. I'll tell you what, that was way better than any acceptance letter I could have ever received, Tony teased. Melissa giggled as her shyness was washed away by Tony's remark. I guess you were right. Good things do happen to those who wait. God, you're so cheesy. Melissa continued to laugh. Melissa started to grow embarrassed again and asked, So, what are we? What do you think? Tony asked with a raised brow. I'm thinking that the kiss felt really nice. And perhaps I would like another one. She said, looking up at him shyly. You don't even have to ask. Tony said as he lowered his head back down towards hers, while she lifted a foot off the ground. Tony and Melissa were now on a plane headed to the USA. My dad is going to freak out when he finds out we are now dating, Melissa said as she held Tony's hand. I'm pretty sure my mom is going to be the opposite. She always viewed you as the daughter she never had, Tony retorted. Melissa had a small blush, just imagining how they were going to break the news. Okay. But did we need to get on a plane first thing in the morning the next day? You know it's for something important, Tony said, shaking his head. I know, I know. I'm sorry. I'm just nervous. How are you more nervous about this than when we took the practical exam? Tony asked in amusement. Asterisk mumble asterisk. Melissa mumbled something incoherent. Pardon? Melissa sighed and covered her face with the back of her hand because I care about us more than an exam I knew we were going to pass. Seeing how beet red she had turned, Tony just had a large smile. Ah! Oh. He said playfully as he pulled her into a large hug. Melissa covered her face with both her hands as Tony chuckled. When they landed, their families were already informed of their arrival, which came as a bit of a surprise since they hadn't heard from them for an entire month. Tony and Melissa exited the plane holding hands with Tony holding two gift bags in the other. As they walked down the steps, they saw their families smiling at them. All their faces froze when they saw the two of them holding hands so intimately. Finally, Howard shouted in exasperation, while Maria smiled and David just shook his head, smiling. Melissa walked with her head down, too embarrassed to look at them. Tony walked towards David and handed him one of the gift bags. Father-in-law, he said, bowing. Howard was holding his stomach, laughing, while Maria slapped his arm, telling him to behave. David took the gift bag and looked at Tony. I take it this means you and my daughter are dating? 
Tony nodded with a serious expression. We only began dating yesterday, so we wanted to inform you guys first, and I thought it was better to do it face to face, to show my sincerity towards your daughter. David nodded, sighing as his smile grew. He put a hand on Tony's shoulder. Don't worry, I accepted the relationship between the two of you a long time ago. Tony, I know you're a fantastic guy, so I know you'll treat my daughter right and make her happy. What did you mean a long time ago? We only started dating yesterday, like I said, Tony said. Confused, David scoffed. Oh please, it was already obvious you two had chemistry together. It was as clear as day you would end up together. Tony looked towards his parents and saw them nodding in agreement. Tony rolled his eyes as Melissa gained a small smile. Anyways, we came for another reason as well. Both Tony and Melissa took out their acceptance letters. We got accepted. They all cheered and hugged Tony and Melissa in congratulations. Howard cheered. This calls for a celebration. As they got in the limo, Tony looked towards his parents with a serious expression. Can we make a quick stop first? Howard looked at Tony in confusion. Tony still held his acceptance letter as he said, I have someone else I need to show this to. Howard had a soft smile as he nodded, pressing the intercom. Take us to the cemetery. The limo started and drove off. Tony sat in front of Jarvis's tombstone. Hey, old friend. Sorry I haven't come to visit recently. You know how life is. Okay, not a very good pun, my bad, he chuckled to himself. Tony grabbed the gift bag and pulled out a green bottle with a red cup in the shape of a disc. This is moonshine, one of the most expensive alcohols I could find. Since I have big news, we have to celebrate. Tony then pulled out his acceptance letter. I did it. I got accepted into one of the most prestigious hero schools in the world. He poured the drink into the cup, laying it and the bottle down as offerings. Just one step closer to my goal, Tony's eyes grew misty as his voice began to crack. This is proof that you don't have to worry, old friend. I'm accomplishing what you believed I could do. I'm showing you that you didn't die for nothing. Tears rolled down his face as his hands slightly trembled, holding his acceptance letter towards Jarvis's grave. Melissa's arms wrapped over his shoulder, holding him as she leaned her head against his, tears streaming down her eyes as well. Tony gave her arms little pats as he wiped his tears. Tony then lifted the sake cup and placed his acceptance letter under it. Here, hold on to it for me, won't you? I'll come and retrieve it once my name resounds around the whole world. Tony then stood up and said his goodbyes. As he walked back, Howard patted his shoulder and smiled warmly. Tony then felt the wind suddenly pick up. When he looked back, he narrowed his eyes slightly, seeing a man in a butler's outfit with his hands behind him. The man gave Tony a smile and nodded before turning into particles of light and disappearing into the wind. Tony blinked, then shook his head and smiled. Now we can celebrate, Tony said with a smile gracing his lips. Third person's POV. Upon learning that Tony and Melissa were going out, Momo had the same reaction as Howard, shouting out. Finally, afterwards, Tony invited Momo and Midoriya for lunch to celebrate getting into UA, together where they met each other for the first time. Then came the time to submit their hero costumes to UA. Tony and Melissa didn't need to do such a thing, but they both helped redesign the costumes, as they were the experts when it came to hero attire. Momo and Midoriya seriously needed the most help due to the designs they were planning on using originally. Then came the morning when school was about to start. Melissa stood dressed in her UA uniform. She did a little twirl for Tony before holding the hem of her skirt. What do you think? Anything you wear looks beautiful on you. So there's no point in me saying anything, Tony said with an eye roll, which caused Melissa to giggle happily to herself. In all seriousness, whoever designed the male version of these clothes needs to be fired, Tony said as he looked himself over. Melissa just fixed his red tie as she said, Well, I think you look very handsome. When do I not? Shall we go now? Tony asked, and Melissa nodded. They both grabbed their bags as they made their way towards the garage. Tony looked towards all of his handmade cars before stopping and looking at the red and white motorcycle. We're taking the bike, Tony said with a grin. 
Melissa shook her head with a sigh and rolled her eyes. Wait here a minute, Tony said as he went back inside. After a minute, he returned with two helmets in hand, one red and another one in blue. He threw the blue one to Melissa, who caught it with one hand and put it on while Tony put on the red one. Tony sat down on the bike, shifted his bag to his front, while Melissa climbed behind him and wrapped her arms around his waist. After turning on the bike, Tony turned towards Melissa. Are you ready? Melissa just wrapped her hands around him tighter in confirmation. And with that, Tony took off, exited the garage with a jump, and they went riding off in a blur while maneuvering through traffic. Due to their speed and Tony's driving skills, they quickly arrived at UA. Upon arrival, Tony stopped the bike and turned it off before they tapped the side of their helmets. The helmets came off of them and slowly compacted themselves into metal discs, which they put into their bags. With their fingers interlocked, they made their way inside the large H building with the sign that read, UA. They quickly found their way inside and walked towards the giant door that said, 1A. As they entered, they found Momo sitting by herself in an empty classroom. Momo, what the hell are you doing? Tony asked, amused. Momo grew embarrassed as she covered her face. I got too excited and arrived 30 minutes early. Tony and Melissa covered their mouths as they tried not to laugh but failed, causing Momo to turn even redder. They then took a seat. Momo sat directly in the middle so Melissa took a seat next to her in another row, while Tony sat next to Melissa in the last row facing the window, or as Tony would call it, the protagonist's seat. Seeing that it would take a while for everyone to arrive, Momo and Melissa started gossiping among themselves while Tony leaned back in his chair, put his feet on the table, and started playing games on his phone. Many more people started entering after Tony and Melissa. As soon as Ida arrived, he immediately walked towards Tony and started to chastise him for putting his legs up on the table. This is a respected school establishment. Aha, uh -huh, Tony said absent-mindedly as he ignored him. Please pay attention when someone is speaking to you. So interesting. We are here to learn. Wow, your words have such profound meanings, Tony said in a monotone voice. Ida started turning red in the face as he saw he wasn't getting through to Tony. Melissa chuckled as she shook her head. Tony, please stop bullying him, she said in a teasing tone. Tony had a small smirk as he sat upright and turned off his phone. Thank you, Ida sighed tiredly. Yes, drill sergeant, Tony said as he did a military salute. Ida's brows twitched before he sighed and went back to his seat. Akugo then entered looking really irritated. He went and sat down before kicking his feet up on the table and crossing his legs. Drill sergeant. Drill sergeant. He has his feet up on the desk. Uhu. Tony said with a large grin as he flicked his wrist like he caught someone doing something bad. Everyone immediately started laughing while Melissa covered her mouth and giggled. Ida laid his head on the desk and had a defeated look. Come on, drill sergeant. What kind of favoritism is this? You chastise me for doing it, but not him, Tony said, shaking his head. Tony then began looking around and noticed that there wasn't a single person missing from the anime, except for Midoriya and Urarika who hadn't arrived yet. Interesting, he thought to himself. The door then opened, and Midoriya walked in as he surveyed the classroom, with Urarika right behind him. As the two of them began talking by the door, Bakugo glared at Midoriya with gritted teeth. The bell then rang, signifying the start of the class. So we got our entrance ceremony and guidance sessions today, yeah? Wonder what our teacher will be like. I'm nervous. Urarika said towards Midoriya, if you are here to socialize, then leave, they heard a monotone voice say. Midoriya and Urarika turned towards the ground in shock as they saw a man in a sleeping bag take out a packet snack and started drinking it. This is the hero course, he said. He then stood up while still wrapped like a yellow caterpillar, which took most of them by surprise. It took you all five seconds to quiet down. It's not bad, but it could still be improved. Time is a precious resource, after all, Aizawa said as he started taking off his sleeping bag. I'm your homeroom teacher, Shota Aizawa. Pleased to meet you all, he said in a monotone voice. He then took out the gym uniform and said, Quickly now, change into your gym clothes and head out to the grounds. They all soon arrived outside in their gym uniforms. 
while Aizawa stood in front of everyone. We will now be testing our quirks, Aizawa said. A test of our quirks? Most of them asked. What about the entrance ceremony or the guidance sessions? Urarika asked. We have no time to waste on useless things like that if you want to become heroes. Yue is known for its freestyle education. That applies to us teachers as well, Aizawa informed them. Softball throwing, the standing long jump, the sidestepping, the grip strength test, etc. You did all of those in your middle school, yes? In your standard no quirks allowed gym tests. Stark. How far could you throw in middle school? Aizawa asked as he pulled out a handball. Wait, Stark, as in Tony Stark from Stark Industries? They all began to whisper among themselves. All shocked as they looked at him in awe. Homeschooled, Tony answered. This caused Aizawa to look up, close his eyes, and sigh. Forget it, he said as he looked around before setting his eyes on Bakugo. And you? Tony felt his eye twitch as Melissa patted his back, trying hard not to laugh since she knew that Aizawa's comment got on his nerves. 67 meters, Bakugo answered. Great, now try it with your quirk. Do whatever you need to do, but don't leave the circle. Aizawa said as he threw the ball to Bakugo, who was now in the softball pitch circle. Bakugo flexed his arms, took a deep breath, arched his arm back, and threw the ball. Die! He screamed as he activated his quirk, creating a large explosion in his hands which sent the ball flying towards the sky. It's important for us to know your limits. That's the first rational step to figuring out what kind of heroes you will be. Aizawa said as he turned his screen towards them, showing 705.2 meters, third person's POV. Everyone was amazed by Bakugo's quirk demonstration and the distance the ball traveled. Whoa, this is awesome. So we can use our quirks for real. Man, this hero course is going to be great. Mina, the pink alien girl, cheered excitedly. Aizawa stared at them as they cheered before saying in a plain voice, Awesome, you say? His voice started to deepen, showing his seriousness as he then said, You're hoping to be heroes after three years here? And you think it'll all be fun and games? Aizawa's eyes turned lifeless as he looked at all of them, right? The one with the lowest scores in all eight events will be judged hopeless and will be expelled. Everyone's eyes widened as they couldn't believe what they just heard. Wait a what? Aizawa raised his hair from his eyes, which started to gain a red glow his smile slowly growing, causing shivers to go down everyone's spines. Your fates are in our hands. I formally welcome you to the hero course of UA. Hi. The lowest score would be expelled? It's only the first day. I would hardly call that fair, Urarika said. The whole world is unfair, Aizawa said as he released and fixed his hair back down. This world is filled with natural disasters and rampant villains. It is the job of the heroes to correct those unfairnesses. If you're hoping to spend your time socializing or making friends, I'm sorry to tell you but for the next three years UA, Hero Course will be putting you through the ringer. The demonstration is over. Now it's time for the real deal. The first event was the 50 meters dash. The first two participants were Tony and Ida. They both got onto the starting line. Well drill sergeant, I guess it's you versus me. Tony said teasingly. Ida fixed his glasses. Please stop calling me that. While Tony and Ida got into position, the gossip started among the others. I heard he was quirkless. Would he be all right? Mina asked. I wouldn't worry about Tony if I were you, Melissa said, stopping them from continuing. He did get first place in both exams for a reason. Midoriya and Momo nodded in agreement. Wait, was he the guy in that suit of armor flying around? Hagakure asked in confusion. No, I'm pretty sure it was a girl that was flying in a suit of armor, Kaminari said. There were two. I was the one in blue and Tony was the one in red, Melissa informed them. They nodded in understanding, while Bakugo looked irritated upon hearing that. As Tony and Ida got into running positions, Tony double tapped his shoes together. The bottom of his shoes suddenly gained thrusters that were difficult to see. Begin, Aizawa announced. Tony turned into a blur as his thrusters pushed him forward. 1.01 seconds, the machine at the finish line announced as Tony slid to a stop. 
Ida was running with his leg engines on as the machine announced, 3.04 seconds. Everyone had their mouths agape as they looked towards Tony, who pushed his hair back as he made his way towards everyone. He turned towards Ida and said, I advise adding wheels on your shoes. It'll help with mobility. Aizawa had an intrigued look. I didn't even notice they carried gadgets. I wonder how many more they have hidden on them. Interesting. Next was Melissa's turn as she was up against Tsuyu Azui. Melissa gave quick taps to her bracelets which quickly morphed over her hands. Begin, Aizawa announced. Melissa shot out repulsors from her hands as she was sent flying forward. 1.20 seconds. Not long after, Azui jumped in. 5.56 seconds. Melissa sighed as she touched her wrists, causing her gloves to retract back into bracelets. So repulsors weren't the way to go. Told you, Tony said with an eye roll. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted to try a different method. Bite me, Melissa scowled before pouting. Tony only chuckled as he put his arm over her. Are the two of you dating? Mina asked, wanting to know the gossip, causing the others to also become interested. No, she's just someone I pay to act as my armrest when my arms get tired, Tony said plainly. Melissa elbowed his side and glared at him. Yes, we are dating, she said as she turned and smiled at Mina. Mina became fascinated. They all continued to gossip as the test continued. Tony became interested when he saw the test was against Midoriya and Bakugo. Oh, this is going to be good. Once they got into position, Aizawa announced, Begin. Midoriya was surrounded by green arcs of electricity and sprinted, while Bakugo's hands caused many explosions that sent him flying forward. As Bakugo crossed the finish line, the machine read 3.34 seconds. Midoriya, who was right on his tail, crossed the line at 3.35 seconds. Bakugo stared at Midoriya with a look of disbelief before his expression contorted into fury. D.K.U. Have you been lying to me all this time? You had a quirk. I, I, I. Midoriya began to stutter, not knowing how to respond. Tony inwardly groaned. He's a late materializer. A what? Bakugo asked, turning his sharp gaze toward Tony. It's someone who develops a quirk later in life. His quirk was too powerful for his child body. So to protect him, his body didn't fully develop the quirk until later in life. Nice save, young Stark All Might, who was peeking and watching everything, said, giving Tony a secret thumbs up. Is that true, Deku? Bakugo asked with narrowed eyes. Midoriya quickly nodded his head. Bakugo scoffed. Whatever. It doesn't matter if you have a quirk or not. You're still an extra just like everyone else. Whoa. I can't imagine coming in fourth place in the entrance exam and having that much pride, Tony scoffed. You bastard. Bakugo shouted as he activated his quirk and flew toward Tony. But before he reached him, he ended up face first on the ground. They all turned toward Aizawa as his hair rose up and his eyes glowed bright red. Drop it. I don't have time for your childish games. Another delay, and I'm expelling everyone without hesitation. Do I make myself clear? As his hair came down, Aizawa lifted his head and started adding eye drops to his eyes with an irritated expression. You kids are really testing my patience. Whoever makes me use my quirk next is automatically expelled as well. Midoriya wanted to fangirl upon realizing who Aizawa was, but he was too scared of upsetting him to say anything else. Everyone else chose to remain quiet as well, not wanting to be expelled. Everyone soon quietly completed the 50-meter dash. Next came the grip strength test. They were each given a machine to squeeze. Tony, like Melissa, tapped on his watch, which slowly turned into metal gloves over his fingers. As he squeezed, he saw that it read 820. When Melissa squeezed hers, she saw it 795. Seeing it, she began to pout. Why is your score always better than mine? Because all of that added pressure also includes my sexiness, Tony said, putting his hand under his chin. Melissa rolled her eyes. You're such a narcissist. Midoriya did his grip test while using full cowling and saw 250. Meanwhile, Momo also had metal gloves, but hers had laces that ran up her fingers, increasing the pressure of her grip. 210? Are you really quirkless? 
Ajui asked, looking down at their scores. That we are. Melissa answered with a nod. Wait, you as well? Urarika asked. Yup. Both of us were born corkless, so we got inventive. As Melissa started making friends, Tony wasn't any different. He stood next to Shoji, looking up at him. So does that mean you can have sex with more than one woman at once? Ha! Huh? Shoji asked, looking at Tony weirdly. Mineta and Kaminari, who were next to him, also looked toward Shoji. Can you? They both asked excitedly. Man, now I'm really jealous of your quirk, Mineta said, biting his nails. Kaminari and Tony both patted him on the back as they nodded. You have a fantastic quirk. You will make a lot of women very happy. Shoji started turning red as he was growing embarrassed by their conversation and praises. You guys are pervs. When they turned, they saw floating clothes next to them. Oh hey, I didn't see you there, Tony teased. Hee hee hee. Why is that the first time I'm hearing someone make that joke? After the grip strength came the standing long jump. Tony, like in the previous test, double tapped his shoes. This time he didn't jump. He just floated up and continued flying until he was at the complete opposite side of the field. How many points does this generate? Tony shouted, cupping his mouth so they could hear him. Aizawa just rubbed his face as he sighed. I can already tell who's going to be the problem child of this class. Third person's POV. After Tony's little performance, the others started taking turns doing the long jumps. Melissa used her new strength alongside her repulsors to jump past the sandbox and land perfectly back on the ground. She struck a little pose afterward, which resulted in Tony doing fast claps, causing her to grow embarrassed and walk toward his side. Meanwhile, Momo made springs attached to the soles of her feet, which she used to jump the entire sandbox as well. After the long jump came the sidestepping. Tony and Melissa both activated their boot thrusters and the repulsors in their hands. They rapidly moved to one side before quickly turning to the other, going back and forth to complete their test. After they were done, they watched Mineta set up two of his purple balls on each side and rapidly bounce off them. Bakugo used the blast from his explosions on each hand to help him, while Ajui used the power of her frog legs to bounce side to side. The fifth test was the ball throw, the same as the demonstration at the beginning of the test. As Tony went up to pitch, he was still a bit irritated at what happened at the start of the demonstration. So he reached into his pockets and pulled out his glasses, putting them on. What is he doing? Hiroshima asked curiously. Melissa sighed. The thing he does best, showing off. Tony brought his wrist up and tapped the middle a few times, bringing forth holographic bars of measurement on the power setting. He put four fingers on the bar and raised them all the way up before closing it like a tab. Tony brought the ball close to him before taking a deep breath. He raised his leg all the way towards the sky before using that momentum to move and twist, then threw the ball. Just before releasing it, he sent out a large beam of repulsion that sent the ball flying, creating a sonic boom. He had to summon his rocket boots to stop the recoil from sending him out of the circle. As the ball flew, Tony sent another beam of repulsion from his hand to keep it flying straight. As the ball started to fall, it fell onto the repulsor Tony had sent out, which sent it flying up towards the skies once more. Tony got on one knee and held his arm out, sending one final repulsor shot. As the ball flew, the repulsor shot came from underneath, sending it even further into the air. Aizawa looked impressed and nodded his head before turning the screen. 5,467 meters. Impressive. Tony nodded as he went back. Then it was Melissa's turn. She looked towards Tony with a confident smirk. This might be the first time I beat you. Good luck, Tony scoffed. Melissa only smiled and walked towards the pitch where she was handed another ball. She then did something that took Tony by surprise. She took off her shoe. She grabbed her shoe, stuffed the ball inside, and activated the thrusters, sending it flying into the skies. She turned towards Tony and gave him a peace sign with her tongue slightly out. Aizawa had an amused look as he flipped the screen, showing the numbers climbing. They had long passed 5,000 and were reaching 10,000 before it turned into an infinity symbol. Tony's mouth was slightly agape before he held his stomach and laughed. Melissa started hopping on one leg as she made her way towards Tony. 
She leaned on him before double-tapping her glasses. Her shoe, which was far off, did a U-turn and started flying back towards Melissa. She caught it, took the ball out, and handed it back to Aizawa before putting her shoe back on. After Melissa, it was Midoriya's turn. He activated full cowling and threw the ball with great force, generating a strong gust of wind. 509 meters, Aizawa said, showing the screen. When it was Momo's turn, she added tiny thrusters to the back of the ball before throwing it. Unfortunately, her thrusters didn't last long, and the ball only made it to 800 meters. For Ajui's turn, she wrapped the ball with her tongue and did a spin before flinging it across. 196 meters, Aizawa announced. After the softball throwing, the seated toe touch was next a regular stretching exercise. The other remaining tests were also regular exercises that didn't really require quirks to perform well. Once all the tests were completed, Aizawa stood in front of everyone. Moving along, time for the results. Your total scores reflect your performance in each event. Explaining the processes would be a waste of time. All you are getting is the final rankings. As Aizawa brought forth the scores, he smiled wildly. Also, I was lying about expelling someone. Everyone stared at Aizawa's smiling expression in disbelief. That was a rational deception meant to bring out the best in all of you, Aizawa explained. Weya. They all screamed. Momo had a hand on her waist. Well, of course it was a lie. It didn't take much to figure it out. I'm sorry, Momo, but you are wrong, Tony said, looking at Aizawa with a plain expression, while Melissa nodded. Eh, I'm wrong. Yup, he really was planning on expelling everyone, Melissa said. Tony pulled out his phone and displayed a hologram of Aizawa's record. Shota Aizawa, aka Eraser Head, the number one B-rank hero. He could be a rank if he wanted to, but he likes to keep a low profile as he is more into espionage. Tony continued during his time at UA. He expelled a total of 157 students due to them failing to meet his criteria. Just last year, he expelled the entirety of Class 1A. So there is no Class 2A in this school. Melissa nodded. Not once has he lied to us. He would have expelled someone or everyone if we had failed to meet his expectations. Everyone had a horrified look as they turned from Tony's information to Aizawa. That wasn't information for you to share, Aizawa said without any emotion. Tony didn't hesitate to retort, staring right back unblinkingly. We are training to be heroes. You, who works in espionage, know how important and valuable information is. Keeping even a single piece of information to oneself can cost lives. Aizawa's grin widened. Good work. You are absolutely correct in your statement. In hero work, information is a saving grace. I'm glad to see someone understands that very well. Anyways, here are everyone's scores. Aizawa said, changing the subject and pointing towards the hologram. 1. Anthony Stark 2. Melissa Shield 3. Momo Yairozu 4. Shoto Todoroki 5. Izuku Midoriya 6. Katsuki Bakugo 7. Tenya Ida 21. Toru Hagakure, 22. Minoru Mineta Bakugo stared at his name and started to breathe heavily, looking at his own hand before turning to Midoriya. His hands started to shake. I'm not even in the top five. Deku scored higher than I did. What the hell? What the hell? What the hell? Bakugo screamed as explosions went off in his hands. There is no way I'm not even in the top five. There's just no way in hell two corkless losers are better than I am. Everyone slowly backed away from Bakugo as they started witnessing his mental breakdown. Aizawa let out a sigh. Class is dismissed. I'll take care of it. Kakin, Midoriya muttered with worry. They all just looked at each other and went back to get changed back into their school uniforms. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were coming out of the school as the test had taken all day. Next to them were Kiminari and Kirishima, with Momo next to Melissa and Mina. In front of them were Midoriya with Ida and Urarika. Come on, dude, you have to share your workout routine. How are you so jacked? Kirishima asked, flexing an arm. I already told you, I took hardcore drugs, Tony said with a smirk. Kiminari laughed while Kirishima continued to look at him expectantly. 
not taking that as a real answer. Tony rolled his eyes. Even if I told you, it wouldn't have the same effects on you. We have different body types. Different body types need different workouts. Hiroshima scratched the back of his head. I suppose you have a point. I think what would be best for you is pure destruction. Tony said. Pure destruction? Both Kirishima and Kiminari looked towards Tony in confusion. Tony nodded. This will probably help your quirk as well. You need to literally break yourself while working out. Your quirk is hardening, right? So, while hardened, break yourself while working out. When you heal, you will have more resistance to breaking, thus making you stronger. Dude, that sounds masochistic as hell, Kiminari said. Would I even be able to heal properly? Not to mention how much time it will take for me to heal, Kirishima sighed. Are you really considering it? Mina asked. I mean, it sounds about right, doesn't it? It will be like working out my muscles, but with my quirk as well. My suggestion get help from the school nurse. She should have a healing quirk, right? And this is a hero school tailored to help students get stronger. I'm sure she will help you heal quickly if you just ask, Tony suggested. That might actually work, Hiroshima said, putting a hand on his chin and stopping in place. I'm sure the teachers are still in, so she might be in her office, Melissa advised. You should hurry and ask. Hiroshima nodded before turning around and running back towards the school. As he ran, he turned towards the others and waved. Thanks for the advice, you guys. He isn't going to kill himself, right? Mina asked a bit worriedly. It sounds like you care about him, Momo said. We went to the same middle school, so we're friends. Mina informed them as they arrived at the entrance of the school. Meanwhile, Tony was tapping on his watch. Not long after, a red and white motorbike appeared in front of them. Whoa, Kiminari said as he looked at it. That thing looks sick. Thank you. I made it myself. Tony said as he and Melissa reached into their bags and took out a disc. They put the disc by their heads and it rapidly transformed into a helmet. Are you guys even old enough to drive that thing? Mina asked. Tony got on with Melissa on the back. Oh, honey. The law doesn't matter when you're rich. Tony said as he turned it on. So we won't be going home together? Momo asked sadly. Sorry, Momo, we have to be at the lab today. Momo looked a bit disappointed but nodded as she understood. Tony gave them the peace sign before driving off. The next day, Bakugo was seen at his desk without much of an expression. His usual scowl was lessened, and he was leaning on his desk with his cheek resting on his hand. It looks like the reality check hit him harder than I thought. Tony thought to himself as he leaned back in his seat. Present Mike was teaching a regular English class as UA. Was still a high school. For the duration of his class, Tony and Melissa were both a bit absent-minded, thinking of what to invent and design. As Present Mike finished his class, there was a brief intermission as they waited for their next teacher. I could possibly make a suit focused purely on speed, like the one Spider-Man once created. I could create one for every basic element like fire, water, earth, and air, Another one purely for speed, another purely for strength, etc. Tony thought to himself. As Tony drew suit designs in his notebook, his thoughts expanded. My suits don't have to be purely Iron Man. What if, instead of metal plating, the suit was made of metal threads? They would be much easier to store, but it would be harder for the suit to carry any weapons. After morning classes, it was lunchtime, served by the Cook Hero Lunch Rush. So did you discuss it with the school nurse? Mina asked Kirishima. Kirishima nodded his head with a smile. Yeah, she said she would be more than happy to help me out. She was a very kind old lady. After lunch came the afternoon classes. While everyone waited for their next teacher, they suddenly heard a voice from the other side of the door. I am. The door slid open with a large force as All Might entered the classroom. Coming through the door like a normal person, he yelled while his cape flapped behind him. All Might? The majority of the class yelled. Uncle Might? You're a teacher at UA. Melissa asked with a large smile. Uncle Might? Does Melissa know All Might? Are they close? All Might is wearing his Silver Age costume. I'm getting goosebumps. 
Some of them started gossiping and fangirling over All Might. You seriously didn't know? Tony asked Melissa. You knew? Melissa turned towards Tony. He's friends with Nizu. What do you think? In my defense, two people from two different occupations can be friends without it having to do with the other's job. I just thought they were close friends, Melissa said defensively. We really have to work on your detective skills, Melissa. Because they are abysmal, Tony said, shaking his head. Melissa started to blush slightly as she pouted. As All Might finished flexing, he looked around the entire classroom. Hero basic training. That will be the class I will be teaching. It will be the class that puts you through all sorts of special training to mold you into heroes. All Might smiled brightly as he gave everyone a thumbs up. For this lesson, we will be having battle training. The walls then started to expand out, revealing metal cases. And for that, you will need these. In accordance with the cork registry and the special request forms you filled out before being admitted. Costumes. Everyone shouted excitedly. After you all change, come to ground beta. After shouting in confirmation, they all went to get changed. One by one, they started to appear on the training ground with multiple buildings around, looking like a replica of a city. Momo had a long, sleeveless red and white one-piece suit which showed her back and the side of her thighs, with a utility belt and white boots. Deku had his green suit which he originally had but with added equipment. He had white arm gauntlets, dark gear, and red shoulder pads and leg boosters which covered half his legs. On his face, he had an open face mask that covered the bottom half of his face. Soon everyone else appeared wearing their superhero outfits and stood in front of All Might. All Might looked around and asked, Where are Melissa and young Stark? Momo raised her hand with a sigh. They are late, sir. You know how Tony likes to make an entrance. They suddenly heard two fast objects moving in the air. When they looked up, they saw two suits of armor flying in the sky. They circled around each other before they both dropped down on one knee with their fists on the ground. They slowly stood back up and started walking towards everyone. Tony wore a black and gold suit with a glowing red centerpiece. Melissa wore a blue and black suit with a golden mask. When they arrived, they heard Tony's metallic voice as he addressed everyone. Sorry we're late, everyone. I failed to realize these suits don't have pockets he said jokingly. So cool. Hiroshima, Kiminari, and Siro shouted with stars in their eyes. Whoa, Melissa, is that you? Mina asked as she knocked on the suits. Ribbit, I gotta agree with the guys on this. Very cool, Ajui said. Did you create this? Jiro asked as she looked at Melissa up and down with interest. Yes, yes I did. We finished making these just yesterday, Melissa said proudly. All Might then clapped his hands to get everyone's attention. All right, all right, everyone, settle down. Class is now in session. The battle training is now about to begin. Third person's POV. Looking good. Everyone, All Might cheered with a thumbs up. Looking presentable is a big part of being a hero. You want to appear dependable and give the reassurance that everything will be all right. Mineta was observing the girls with a pervy expression while Tony and Melissa just stared at Hagakure. What? she asked, noticing their gazes. Why the hell are you naked? Both Melissa and Tony asked at the same time. Wah! You can see me? She screamed as she went and hid behind Melissa. It's a bit difficult, but we can see your outline as you reflect light off your body. Melissa explained. The floating gloves went and covered her face. This is the only way I would be able to use my quirk. Otherwise, my clothes would be detectable. Both Tony and Melissa sighed. We are building you a new suit. They both said once again simultaneously. Huh? Would you really be able to do it? Agacure asked shyly. Tony and Melissa nodded their heads. It's honestly a very simple procedure, Melissa said. As they continued to discuss Hagakure's wardrobe situation, the others looked around their surroundings. Ida raised his hand. This is like the entrance exams. Will we be battling robots in the cityscape once more? No, young Ida, All Might said as he went into further detail of their training exercise. You will all be experiencing an indoor battle training exercise. Although most fights against villains often occur outdoors, 
More often than not, you will have to face villains indoors. Now, then, everyone will be split into two oppositions. That of a hero and that of a villain. You will all then battle in a two versus two indoor battle. All Might started explaining. Everyone immediately started asking questions. What determines victory? Are you going to expel us if we fail like Aizawa? How will we divide ourselves? Don't I just look absolutely fabulous? Whoa, whoa. Everyone calm down. Give me a chance. All Might said as he motioned for them to calm down. All Might took a paper from his pocket and began to read it like a script. All right, listen up, everyone. The villains will be hiding a nuclear weapon in their hideout. The hero will have to go in and take care of it. The hero will have a limited amount of time to either capture the villain or secure the weapon. The villain either has to capture the hero or wait till the timer is up. Who will be heroes or the villains will be decided by drawing lots. He announced, taking out a box. Let's see. All Might muttered as he rapidly counted while moving his finger. When he was done, he said, it seems we have a bit of a situation. Due to the number of people, there will be a three versus three as one of the fights. All right, show of hands, who wouldn't mind being the two to pull lots out to see which team they will be in. Tony and Melissa raised their hands, and as All Might saw them, he nodded his head. All right, you two will be the last two to pick. They all soon drew lots, making their teams. The ones with three members on them were the letters C and I, which were unsurprisingly the two letters All Might pulled out from the hero and villain slot, respectively. Tony and Melissa looked at their lots and saw that Tony had the letter I, which meant he was the villain, while Melissa had the letter C which meant she was the hero. Yes, I'm the villain. Yes, I'm the hero. Both Tony and Melissa turned towards each other, narrowed their eyes, and scoffed before turning away and walking towards their teammates. Tony's teammates consisted of Momo and Shoji, while Melissa's consisted of Todoroki and Aoyama. He he, it looks like we'll be the villains, Tony said to his teammates, rubbing his hands together. Why do you want to be the villain so bad? Shoji asked. Well, big guy, it's because, for one, it's fun. And two, who wouldn't like to be a rebel once in a while? Tony said proudly. Since the teams have been decided, both teams get into positions. I, alongside the rest of your classmates, will be watching your battle via the CCTV. The villains will get a five-minute start to prepare. When the timer is up, the heroes sneak in and stop the villains. Good luck, everyone. All Might, alongside the others, went to the showroom where they watched everything from the CCTV. Tony, alongside his teammates, were near the nuclear weapon they had to defend. All right, here's what we'll do. First, Momo, I will need you to make some things for me. Todoroki, without much emotion, turned towards the others. Stand back and don't step foot inside if you don't want to get frostbite. What are you planning to do? Melissa asked. Just wait patiently. Based on your costume, I'll assume you have an ice cork. Based on your words, I'm going to assume you're planning on freezing everything. Am I wrong? Melissa asked. Todoroki stared at her for a bit and shook his head. Yeah, I thought so. But you see, that won't work. Why? Todoroki asked. Because we made these suits tailored to dealing with any kind of quirks. Ice especially, so Tony will most definitely have a counter for them. I see. So what do you suggest? Todoroki asked. After they finished discussing, Melissa gave her forearm a bit of a tap. From it came out a tiny flying machine. What does it do? Aoyama asked curiously. From her forearm, a hologram appeared connected to the flying machine. It's a spy drone. It'll allow us to view what they are doing without being detected. Melissa controlled the flybot and made it fly towards their windows. She saw Tony in his Iron Man suit leaning against the wall arrogantly while the nuke was surrounded by electric wiring. Can you see further into the room? Todoroki asked. I can't get too close. Otherwise, Tony will be able to detect it. All right, we can work with this. We will go with your plan. Todoroki nodded without much of an expression. Heroes may now enter. All Might informed the heroes. Melissa grabbed Todoroki and Aoyama by their collars and flew towards the outside window of the top floor and threw both Todoroki and Aoyama in. Once inside, Todoroki froze all the traps while Aoyama turned towards Tony and thrusted his hip shooting his laser beam from his stomach. 
Melissa flew in behind them and put her hand on the nuke. Once her hands were on it, she turned towards Tony, looking smug, but her expression froze as she saw the suit of armor crumble into pieces as it was hit by Aoyama's beam. Todoroki turned towards Melissa in confusion. Your hands are on it. How come we haven't been declared the winner? This room is a decoy. Before Melissa had a chance to answer, two sheets came off the wall, revealing Shoji and Momo each carrying a large stick. They both put the sticks next to Aoyama and Todoroki's necks and electrocuted them unconscious. In front of the nuke, Tony undid his cloaking and blasted a red repulsor beam from his palm, hitting Melissa and sending her flying into the next building. Melissa stood up from the rubble, irritated, and flew towards Tony, where they both met in the middle with a punch. As their fists connected, Melissa shot a repulsor beam from underneath, hitting Tony's stomach and sending him flying into the air. Tony immediately stabilized himself and sent two repulsor beams from his hands towards Melissa. Melissa turned her body, dodging the repulsors, and shot some of her own. From her shoulders, two miniature rockets appeared and flew towards Tony. Two of the same rockets appeared from Tony's shoulders and flew towards Melissa's, creating a giant explosion that filled more than half the sky with black smoke. Meanwhile, in the showroom, are they trying to kill each other? Mina asked. Rip it. I thought they were going out. I don't think that's how a couple would behave towards one another, Ajui said awkwardly. Bakugo sat on the couch, leaning forward with his arms on his knees and his hands interlocking, his eyes following their every move. His scowl was gone, replaced by a serious expression. Whoa! Even though they're corkless, they seem so powerful, Eurarika said in wonder. Are we really sure they're corkless? Jiro asked with an uneasy smile. Tony waited for Melissa to pop out from the black smoke, but when she didn't, his eyes widened. I'm not the goal, he muttered with a smile. Melissa flew back towards the building, but before she could enter, Shoji appeared wearing a large metal gauntlet. Instead of meeting him head-on, Melissa shot repulsors from her hands, making Shoji dodge out of the way. Melissa didn't hesitate to increase her thrusters and fly back into the building past Shoji and Momo, who had no choice but to move out of the way if they didn't want to be injured. Not long after Melissa passed by them, Tony appeared, flying after her. In the showroom, everyone was following the CCTVs up and down and to the side as Tony chased Melissa while she searched every floor she passed. All of their heads were moving frantically, trying to keep up. Even Bakugo's eyes shifted rapidly before looking down and closing his eyes. His hands clenched into fists, releasing barely audible explosions. Melissa blasted a door open with her repulsors and found a room filled with nukes. Her eyebrows twitched upon seeing them. Melissa's HUD scanned everything in the room before she noticed something. But before she could act, Tony appeared behind her and tackled her through the walls, ending up outside. As they ended up outside, they spun around before Tony landed on the ground with Melissa on top of him with her repulsors ready. Stand down, Tony. You were smart to have Momo make a hologram disc to fill the room with holograms. But that won't be enough. Tony's mask lifted up, exposing his face, which showed him sticking his tongue out playfully towards her as he put his hands behind his head. Melissa's eyes widened. Son of A.B. And that's time. The villain team wins. Third person's POV. Tony and the rest soon appeared in the showroom with everyone else. Tony and Melissa didn't want to be in their suits all day, so they came out of them and sat down on the couch. Does someone want to take a guess at what each team did right and wrong? All Might asked as he looked around. Momo raised her hand immediately. Oh, young Yayorozu, go ahead, All Might said with a nod. This might come off as gloating, but I think everyone did their part wonderfully. Each team worked as a team. They got together and worked out a plan of attack. Our team, the villains, focused on what we were supposed to do. Stopping the heroes and securing the nuclear weapon. The hero team focused on what they were supposed to do. Stopping the villains and capturing the weapon. Though if I had to criticize someone, it would be Melissa. She viewed Tony as the biggest obstacle, so she put Shoji and me as low-priority targets, which cost her the lives of her teammates, even though she planned to end everything quickly and in one fell swoop. Now, if this was a real scenario, 
she did focus on the main objective. Taking the weapon away from the villains at all costs, even if it ended up in failure due to Tony's planning. Gee, good job, you've said exactly what I was thinking. I couldn't have said it better myself. All Might stuttered due to Momo's review before turning towards everyone. Let this be a lesson, young heroes. Never underestimate your opponents. It may end up costing you dearly, All Might said with a serious expression. They all nodded their heads, while Melissa looked down in a bit of shame. Tony just massaged her back to make her feel better. Now, on to the next team, All Might said cheerfully as he reached into the slots and took out the letters A and D from the hero and villain slots. The A team consisted of Midoriya and Urarika, who were the hero team. The D team consisted of Bakugo and Ida, who were the designated villains. As they all went and got ready, Melissa bowed towards Todoroki and Aoyama. I'm sorry, you guys. Because of me, we ended up failing. It's alright, Mon Amy. Even in failure, I still look fabulous. Aoyama said with a flap of his cape while looking into the distance. Meanwhile, Todoroki just looked towards her before turning to the screen to watch how the next team was doing. There were a few seconds of silence before he said, We were a team. It is your fault as well as mine. Thank you, Melissa said as she bowed once more. Meanwhile, Tony saw Bakugo rush out as he went flying with his explosions, leaving Ida alone with the nuke. Luckily, I can read lips. Tony thought to himself as he watched Bakugo give the order to take care of the nuke by himself while he handled Deku and Gravity Girl. Even if his usual scowl was gone, his brow knitted in anger as his hands were behind him. Deku! Tony saw Bakugo shout. Midoriya immediately prepared for the offensive, already anticipating his confrontation. But instead of going for Midoriya, Bakugo blasted himself over him and drop-kicked Urarika, who was behind him, taking everyone by surprise. He shouted towards Midoriya to make them think he was going for him, but actually, he was going for Urarika. I have to say, that's pretty smart of him, Tony inwardly praised. Bakugo then started fighting both of them with aggression and ferocity. Even when he was affected by Urarika's quirk, he still moved like he wasn't affected. Everything flashed with green and dark orange colors as Midoriya and Bakugo duked it out. When Urarika tried to escape, Bakugo put a hand on her stomach and sent her flying back, crashing hard against a wall, causing the others to wince. Isn't he using a little too much force with her? Ajui asked, tilting her head to the side with a finger by her chin. Nope, I even dare say he's doing a fine job, Tony said as he leaned his head back on the couch, sitting rather arrogantly with his hands spread out on top, with Melissa leaning into his arms. Everyone looked at him weirdly. What do you mean by that? Mina asked curiously. Two things, Tony said as he lifted two fingers. One, Bakugo's job is to act as the villain. He isn't holding back and is treating her as any old villain would. Villains don't care about gender. They only care about accomplishing their goal and won't hesitate to eliminate anyone in their way. Male, female, young or old, crippled or not. Most of them were surprised by Tony's words, but what he said made sense to them, and they nodded in agreement. And two, Bakugo is treating her like a UA. Student, Urarika has been accepted into UA. For a reason, she's strong. One doesn't get into UA. For being weak. Plus, Bakugo has a very high battle IQ. He may look like an out-of-control idiot, but he knows what he has to do. How do you know Bakugo has a high battle IQ? This is only our second day here. Ojiro, the guy with the tail, asked. One, someone who can fight two people at once like that has to have a high battle IQ. And two, Tony took out his phone, swiped a few times, and then flipped it over, revealing Bakugo's entrance exam footage. I've done my research. Kaminari turned towards Tony and said, Dude, you're kind of scary, you know that? Tony just smiled proudly. Thank you. That wasn't a compliment, Kaminari muttered. All Might turned towards Tony. You know that footage belongs solely to UA, right? Tony shrugged his shoulders. Then it shouldn't be that damn hackable. I literally got this footage in a matter of seconds. Tony and the others then focus back on the fight between Midoriya and Bakugo. Midoriya was jumping from wall to wall, 
building momentum before kicking towards Bakugo. Bakugo blocked Midoriya's kick with his grenade gauntlets, causing him to grit his teeth due to the strength of Midoriya's kick. Bakugo grabbed Midoriya's leg and used his explosions to spin around and throw him toward Uraraka. But Midoriya managed to recuperate in time and slid to a stop on the floor. Uraraka, go up, Midoriya quickly ordered as his right arm started sparking with electricity. No, you don't, you damn nerd. Bakugo shouted as he pulled both pins on his grenade gauntlets and pushed his hands towards the ground while shouting. IT doesn't matter if you have a quirk all of a sudden. You will always be below me, you damn extra. You know what, I take it back. He is simply an out-of-control idiot. Brace yourselves, Tony said, causing everyone to look towards him. Oh. Even from their building, they felt the ground shake, followed by an earth-shattering explosion. They watched as the floor below Midoriya and Uraraka completely crumbled, destroying the floors beneath them and making them all fall. The entire structure then became unstable, causing it to completely collapse, with Ida coming down as well. And the villain team wins, Tony said in a mocking voice as he got up and walked towards his suit, with Melissa walking towards hers. Where are you two going? Momo asked. To dig them out, Tony said as he walked back to his suit, which closed around him and Melissa. Both Tony and Melissa flew towards the site and started moving the rubble, getting everyone out to safety. You guys look like shit, Tony said as he looked at their dirty and bloody forms. Tony then looked towards Bakugo. Nice going, dumbass. Bakugo only scowled towards Tony and tried to get up but groaned in pain. I wouldn't do that if I were you. You have some broken bones in your arms and ribs from being a suicide bomber. Just leave me alone, you metal bastard, Bakugo groaned. Tony ignored him and flew them all to Recovery Girl to receive their treatment then flew back to the others. Thank you, young Stark and Melissa, for getting them the help they needed. All Might nodded towards them. Tony and Melissa just nodded as they exited their suits and sat down. Now, then, we will give Midoriya and the others their evaluation when they return. Who's next? All Might said, trying to maintain a positive attitude. One by one, they went and fought against each other. Some heroes won rather easily while some of the villains won with careful planning, strategies, and power. After each battle, Tony, Melissa, Momo, and All Might gave their perspectives on the evaluation. Then Midoriya and the others returned, covered in bandages. Are you guys ready to get criticism after being released from the hospital? Tony teased. Midoriya and Uraraka had awkward expressions, while Bakugo didn't show much expression and just scoffed towards Tony. Ida let out a sigh of resignation. For the hero team, Midoriya and Uraraka, you two showed great teamwork and strategy. Midoriya, you anticipated Bakugo's moves and tried to use his aggression against him. Uraraka, you provided support and stayed focused despite the intense pressure. However, you both underestimated Bakugo's unpredictability and brute force. Midoriya, you need to improve your defense against unexpected attacks and Uraraka, try to keep your distance and utilize your quirk more creatively to avoid close combat situations, at least for now until you can learn to fight in close quarters. For the villain team, Bakugo, your aggression and ferocity were effective in keeping your opponent's attention on you and stopping them from focusing on the nuke. You were doing great with your initial feint and kept up relentless pressure, but you got too emotional. You need to be mindful of the collateral damage your attacks can cause. You're strong, but control is key. Your final move, while effective, was excessive and reckless, leading to unnecessary injuries and damage. Only an idiot attacks without thinking things through. Ida, your only downfall was having Bakugo as a teammate. Even though you guys won, I'm sure you are unsatisfied with that kind of victory. Everyone just stopped and stared at Tony with their mouths agape, unsure how to react. Even Bakugo was looking at him weirdly, unsure how to insult him properly. All Might coughed into his fist to break the awkward tension. That was a great assessment, young Stark. I don't think I have much else to say that you haven't already said. All Might turned towards everyone and gave them a thumbs up. Good work, everyone. This battle has shown everyone your strengths and weaknesses. All that is left is to keep practicing overcoming those weaknesses and grow as promising heroes. Now then, 
everyone class is dismissed. Plus ultra. All Might said as he skedaddled out with a large smile. Third person's POV. Tony and Melissa were both in their lab, dressed casually. Tony wore a tight short-sleeved shirt with sweatpants, while Melissa sported a long tank top and jean shorts, her glasses hanging loosely on her face and her hair tied in a messy bun. Tony was focused on designing Hagakure's suit, making corrections and adding bonuses. Meanwhile, Melissa was brainstorming new suit designs and ideas. They each had a large tablet and stylus in hand at their respective tables. Any ideas for suits? Melissa asked, feeling stuck. Yeah, I was actually thinking of something. How about a skin-tight suit instead of a metal one? It would give us better flexibility, but the downside would be fewer weapons, Tony suggested, leaning back and scrutinizing his design before starting over. What do you mean? Melissa asked, intrigued. I mean, the suit would still enhance our strength and capabilities, but instead of heavy metal plating, it would use flexible materials like unstable molecule fibers. And instead of built-in weapons and missiles, we could integrate your weapon ideas. Could be like a mercenary suit with swords and handguns, Tony explained. I see what you're going for, Melissa said, her hands immediately starting to move. After a while, Melissa finished her drawing and swiped it to Tony's screen for his review. Tony noticed the arc reactor in the center with neon lights flowing through the suit. On its back were two katanas and two hand cannon revolvers, with a sleeker version of the Iron Man helmet. We could give the swords and guns different elemental abilities like ice, fire, electricity, and pure energy modes, Tony suggested, sketching his ideas for the weapons and forwarding them to Melissa. I see. I like the idea. How about making it so you can unleash elemental slashes from the sword? Hee hee, Melissa said excitedly, her hands moving rapidly. Let's connect the sword and gun with a neural link, so we can switch modes in seconds, Tony added, finishing the last touches on Hagakure's suit. Tony then commanded Friday to begin production of Hagakure's outfit. He and Melissa then collaborated on making the suits, configuring the weapons and other enhancements. After three hours, they finished their suits. Two suits were displayed on mannequins. One black with bright blue accents and a blue helmet, and the other suited more for a female, in black and purple with a similar helmet. Both had a black hood with a cape. I'm still amazed you managed to turn vibranium into small threads and integrate them with unstable molecule fibers, Melissa said in awe, shaking her head. It was actually quite straightforward. The unstable molecule fibers, UMF, are inherently unstable, which makes them flexible enough to integrate with vibranium threads, Tony explained. Melissa turned to Tony with a smile. Shall we try them on? Is that even a question? Tony grinned, going to the mannequin and activating the arc reactor on its chest. The threads unraveled and stored themselves inside the reactor. Melissa and Tony grabbed the reactor and placed it on their chests, double tapping to release the threads that formed the suit around their bodies. They extended their hands, and the sword sheaths flew from the mannequins to them. They secured the sheaths on their backs and holstered their guns at their hips. Helmets flew toward them, turned around, opened up, and secured themselves on their faces. A large blue V covered Tony's face, while a purple one covered Melissa's. Okay, that was so cool, Melissa exclaimed, giddy with excitement. I know, right? Tony echoed her enthusiasm. Do we call them Marks? Melissa asked curiously. Yup, they're Mark 29 skin suit. The name is still pending, though. Now come on, let's try them out, Tony said, already running through his lab. Melissa followed eagerly. Tony unlocked a door with a touch, leading them into an empty space. Friday, initiate a simulation where we're discovered and surrounded by ninjas, trying to take us down, Tony commanded excitedly. The scene around them began to change as they were transported to an open green field outside a traditional Japanese home. Ninjas surrounded them, clad in black with red scarves, wielding katanas and kanai. Tony and Melissa moved with precision and power, their swords emitting a cold fog with an ice-blue glow. Tony nodded approvingly as he spun his blade in his hand. Nice. Friday begin, Tony commanded. He dashed forward meeting the charging ninjas head-on. Tony maneuvered between them, cutting down his opponents with swift strokes. 
the wounds he inflicted frosted over, freezing their weapons upon contact before he decapitated them. Meanwhile, Melissa moved gracefully, her face lit up with a big smile. She leaped into the air, landing with a powerful stab of her swords into the ground. An icy blast emanated from the impact point, freezing the ninja's legs in place. Tony quickly joined her, using her as a springboard to spin and twirl around, decapitating more ninjas with each fluid movement. Some ninjas threw kanais at him, but Tony deflected them skillfully, rolling away from any threats. Melissa drew her handgun, firing frost energy bullets at the remaining adversaries. Tony's sword began to change color, glowing bright red. He melted weapons and bodies alike, cleanly severing heads with ease. With a powerful slash, two red arcs flew from his sword, leaving open cuts on their targets. The ninjas adapted, dodging Tony and Melissa's attacks more effectively with each confrontation. One ninja managed to sneak close and slice Tony's side, but his suit protected him from the attack. Melissa stowed her guns and retrieved her swords from the ground. Electricity sparked from the edges, enhancing the cutting power of her strikes. She swung her sword overhead, sending a ninja's head flying into the air before slicing it cleanly as it fell. The battle raged on, Tony and Melissa combining their elemental abilities and combat skills to overcome the increasingly resilient ninjas. After they were done testing their weapons, they high-fived each other. Tony then brought her close, prompting their mask to drop from their faces. Tony just held her cheek and kissed her, which Melissa liked a lot. If our test results in a kiss, we should start doing it more often. Melissa teased playfully. Tony only smirked. Honey, I don't need a successful test for it to be the right time to kiss you. He said teasingly before bringing her for another. Oh yeah? And why is that? Melissa asked as she held his face with a loving smile. Because all the time is the perfect time to kiss you, he said as he kissed her once more, making Melissa giggle at his corny words. Third person's POV. The next day, like previously, Tony and Melissa both got off their motorcycles and began walking to school together with their fingers interlocked. Immediately, they were bombarded by the shutter and blinding light of cameras flashing in their faces. They grabbed their sunglasses and continued walking as reporters started asking them questions. Oh wow, it's Anthony Stark. I heard you've been accepted into UA. Do you have anything to say about it? Are Stark Industries and UA high collaborating? What is your opinion of All Might working as a teacher? Are you one of All Might students? As everyone knows that you are corkless, did you bribe UA into letting you in? Tony lowered his sunglasses and stared right at the man who asked that. Oh, Melissa muttered with a sigh. Did you really just ask me that? Tony asked, raising an eyebrow. Everyone fell silent. They all heard the sound of the man gulping slightly and watched intently, waiting with bated breaths. Tell me, do you think I made Stark Industries what it is today by bribing people? I'll answer that question for you. I didn't. Stark Industries stands as a beacon of innovation and hard work. I faced challenges, skepticism, and countless obstacles. But I didn't overcome them by simply throwing money at them. I did it with my mind, my determination, and my vision. Being corkless doesn't make me less capable. If anything, it's pushed me to work harder, think smarter, and innovate relentlessly. You see, power isn't just about physical abilities or flashy quirks. True power lies in resilience, intelligence, and the willingness to push beyond limitations. When I applied to UA, I didn't ask for special treatment. I submitted the same application, took the same exams, and faced the same scrutiny as every other student here. And I got in because I earned it. Never underestimate someone because they're different. If anything, it's our differences that give us strength. So, to anyone who doubts me or thinks I don't belong here because I'm quirkless, remember this. It's not the quirks that define us. It's our actions and our relentless pursuit of excellence. I didn't bribe my way into UA. I fought for it just like I fight for everything else I believe in. And if you still doubt me, then watch closely. Because I'm just getting started. The silence that followed was palpable, broken only by the many flashes of light that could have blinded someone. Tony put on his glasses and strutted forward, 
holding Melissa's hand in one hand and a gift bag in the other. No more questions, Tony Stark out, Tony said as he threw up a peace sign. The reporters kept trying to ask him questions, but Tony ignored them and headed inside. That bastard, asking if I bribed myself in. Who does he think he is? I should get him fired for such nonsense, he grumbled. Melissa giggled as she went on her tiptoes and kissed his cheek. Well, I thought you were wonderful out there. I thought you were gonna curse that guy out publicly. I got worried. Oh, please. I still have a reputation to uphold. I should be the one saying, oh, please. You would totally do that and not care if the entire world was watching. They soon arrived at the giant door of Class 1A, where they found the others already seated. They were the last two to arrive, but luckily class hadn't started. Here, Tony said, placing the gift bag on top of Hagakure's desk. Huh, she asked in surprise. Already? I thought it would have taken longer. Hagakure excitedly reached into the bag and found a metal case similar to the ones where the others stored their suits. When she opened it, she saw a beautiful black outfit with long, fingerless gloves and little bags that attached to the thighs. As soon as Hagakure touched it, it turned invisible. Whoa! She released it and it reappeared before she grabbed it again and it disappeared once more. She immediately stood up and hugged both Melissa and Tony. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. She repeated a thousand times. The others were curious and watched. Melissa then started describing the material and the effect her suit had. It is made from unstable molecule fibers, a unique material only Tony has been able to make. It's the perfect material for any hero suit because it can adapt to various environments and powers. For your suit, it synchronizes with your quirk, allowing it to become invisible whenever you do. It also provides enhanced durability, flexibility, and temperature regulation. Plus, the little bags on the thighs are for carrying any small tools or gadgets you might need. Not to mention, the shoes are made from sound dampening material, so you don't have to worry about making noise when you move. You also see the black rings, they are connected to strong black wires that are extremely durable, so you should be able to capture people rather easily now as well. You don't have to worry, they turn invisible too, Tony said with a proud look. All of a sudden, they heard loud crying from in front of them. I don't know why you guys are doing this for me, but thank you. I'm sorry, but it's just weird that you were naked all the time, Tony said awkwardly, unsure of how to comfort her. Melissa just hugged Hagakure and then Aizawa walked in and saw the other girls jump in to comfort Hagakure. What's wrong with her? Aizawa asked. I'm afraid it's because I'm too handsome. It just brings some women to tears. Sigh, maybe I do have a quirk. And this is it, Tony lamented. Aizawa just stared at Tony while the others covered their mouths, trying not to laugh in front of him. In your seats, everyone, class is about to begin, Aizawa said, choosing the best course of action possible to completely ignore Tony. Tony felt it was a shame he didn't get any reaction from Aizawa. I suppose no reaction is a reaction in itself, he thought. I have seen and reviewed all of the footage from your battle training with All Might. You all did well. Except you, Bakugo. Grow up. You are talented. Stop wasting it on being childish and throwing temper tantrums. Bakugo clicked his tongue, looking irritated at being singled out but what irritated him further was that he knew he deserved it. Now then, on to homeroom business, Aizawa said with his usual apathetic look. You will be picking a class president, a completely normal school activity, they all simultaneously thought. Everyone soon raised their hands and started shouting to be picked. Even Bakugo seemed enthusiastic about being elected. Let's do this the old democratic way. We will put it to a vote, and the one with the most votes wins. To make it more interesting, you guys can't vote for yourselves, Tony said as he leaned back in his chair. But we don't really know each other well enough to carefully select who we believe would be a good class president. Ribbit, as we pointed out. That's what makes it interesting, Tony smirked. Let's do it. Kirishima cheered. It sounds fun, Mina nodded. Everyone soon started agreeing, finding the idea acceptable. Since everyone has agreed, we will write our names on a piece of paper. We will count them at the end. And the one with the most votes wins, Tony added. Everyone looked at the votes. 
Tony Stark, 10 Melissa Shield, 5 Momo Yayorozu, 4 Midoriya, 2 Bakugo 1. I thought we agreed on no voting for yourself. Bakugo, Tony teased. How the hell was I supposed to know you were actually following such an idiotic rule? Plus, the one I believe has a chance to lead is me. Damn it. Bakugo shouted in embarrassment. Tony walked up to the podium and put his sunglasses on. Is it better to be feared or respected? Everyone looked at Tony curiously, waiting for him to continue. I say, is it too much to ask for both? Tony said as he leaned on the podium. A hero must walk a fine line between fear and respect. Those who should fear you will do so, and those you aim to protect will respect you. Fortunately for all of you, I can handle both perfectly. In this role, I promise to be a leader who embodies these qualities. I'll be someone who can strike fear into the hearts of villains and command respect from allies and peers alike. But it's not just about power or authority. It's about responsibility and empathy. A true hero understands the weight of their actions and the impact they have on others. I will ensure that our voices are heard, our needs are met, and our potential is realized. Together, we'll push the boundaries of what it means to be a hero. We'll train harder, learn more, and grow stronger. We'll support each other through every challenge and celebrate every victory. As your class president, I'll fight for what is right, not just what is easy. I'll listen to your concerns and work tirelessly to create an environment where we can all thrive. Because at the end of the day, being a hero isn't just about the powers we wield or the battles we fight. It's about the difference we make in the world and the legacy we leave behind. So, let's stand together, united in our pursuit of greatness. Let's show the world what it truly means to be heroes of UA. Hi, thank you, and plus ultra, everyone, Tony started waving like a prince as he held his chest and spun his hand side to side. We've created a monster, Melissa muttered with a heavy sigh. Everyone just stared at Tony with their mouths agape, wondering if they had really chosen correctly. Even Aizawa, who was lying on the ground wrapped in his sleeping bag, stared at Tony's backside strangely before choosing what was best for his state of mind and needed sleep, ignoring him as always. Third person's POV. Lunchtime. Was that speech really necessary? Melissa asked Tony, looking at him in confusion. Of course it was. I was practicing for when I actually run for president, Tony replied. Wait, really? Momo asked as she sat in front of them with a tray of food in her hands. What? Of course not. You actually believe I would bother with something like that? Tony scoffed. Yes, Momo instantly replied. Absolutely, Melissa nodded. I don't even know you that well, and I agree with them, Mina nodded. Just based on what I've seen these past few days, you look like someone who would run for president. That is the nicest thing anyone has ever said to me. Thank you, Tony said with a hand on his chest. Mina had an amused expression. Kaminari and Kirishima then appeared, sitting on Mina's left side. Sup? Hey, did you guys also get interviewed by the reporters outside? Kaminari asked motioning towards the reporters still seen outside the school. Mina sighed and nodded. They were relentless. I mean, All Might is the number one hero. It's expected that the reporters would show up upon learning about it. Hiroshima added as he stuffed his mouth with food. Aren't you eating a little bit too much? Mina asked, looking at his plate of food. I kinda have to. Ever since I started my new training, I'm always left exhausted and hungry after Recovery Girl heals me. Alarm, alarm, security level 3 has been breached. All students, please evacuate in an orderly fashion. Everyone soon heard. A loud siren resounded through the cafeteria. Flashes of red lights appeared by the exits, which started mass hysteria. Every student got up and started pushing everyone away so they could get out faster. Momo and the others were also about to get up, but Tony stopped them. Momo, I need a favor. Create some earplugs for everyone here. What? Just do it. And quickly, Momo did as she was told and handed earplugs to everyone. As they all had their earplugs in, Tony stood on the table and held a tiny device in his hand. As he pressed it, it released a high-pitched sound wave, causing everyone to stop and hold their ears in pain. 
Tony reached into his pockets and pulled out another device, which he connected to his throat before turning off the sound machine. Seeing that he got their attention, Tony's voice was heard throughout the cafeteria. If you all stop behaving like idiots and look outside, you would see that this is caused by news reporters. There is no danger, so as heroes in training, stop making fools out of yourselves. Good thing I prepared for this. Tony inwardly patted himself on the back as he sat back down. The others then took out their earplugs. As expected of the class president, Mina said, giving him a thumbs up. Thank you, thank you, Tony said as he bowed. He then stood up and grabbed his burger and fries from the plate before getting up. Where are you going? Momo asked curiously. To see what actually happened. I'm coming with, Melissa said, following after him. The others were left to look at each other in confusion. As Tony and Melissa arrived outside, they found the police had already arrived and were ushering everyone out. That was quick, Tony thought. But we did take our time getting here. Stark, what are you doing here? Shouldn't you be at lunch? Aizawa asked. Tony, who took a bite of his burger, just shrugged his shoulders. I got curious. Aizawa sighed, just go back inside. We already have everything handled. Uh-huh, Tony said as he chewed nonchalantly. So listen, this is a highly secured establishment. I doubt a bunch of reporters did this, he said, reaching down and taking some fries into his mouth. You think this was done with a different purpose in mind? Yup, I mean it's pretty obvious. You're a smart man who works in espionage. This shouldn't come as a surprise to you. Aizawa nodded his head. You might be right, but this is a job for the teachers of UA. We have everything under control, so like I said earlier, you can head back inside. Yeah, sorry, can't do that. You see, my life might be threatened. I'm a very important person, so I take security very seriously. Tony handed Aizawa his food. Here, hold this for a sec. Tony dusted his hands and reached for his phone. Melissa, help me out here for a bit. Melissa nodded and took out her phone as well. They both began scanning the breached place and the dust piled up on the ground from the disintegrated doors. Friday, try to see if you can get any footage the reporters might have of what just occurred. They could be of use. It wasn't long before Nizu appeared, with Midnight following right behind. What are they doing? Midnight asked curiously. Aizawa sighed. They are investigating the crime scene. After Tony and Melissa were done, they both walked up to Nizu. All right, do you want the good news or bad news? Tony asked. Nizu looked at Tony for a bit before nodding. The bad news first. This was done by a single person, meaning he has a pretty powerful quirk. And most likely, he didn't do this to help the reporters but for personal gains. And the good news? Nizu asked. The students aren't the target. How do you know that? Midnight asked. It's common sense, really. Yue hasn't been attacked for many years. Suddenly, you get a new and awesome teacher and then it gets attacked. Which means the target is... Tony motioned for them to finish the sentence. All Might, Mizu, Aizawa, and Midnight Side. Ding, ding, ding. Bingo, but no prize. Tony and Melissa then joined their phones together and aimed them towards the gates of the school. A holographic projection of someone holding out their hands and touching the doors appeared, showing it all then crumbling down. Based on our research, the quirk is most likely related to decaying and disintegration, Melissa informed them, showing a video of atoms breaking apart before it expanded, showing the pile of dust that was once the gates. I see, Nizu said with a hand on his chin. Is there an event or special training All Might will be in? Tony asked before shaking his head. Don't answer that. I'll just look for it myself. Tony began rapidly tapping on his phone. Let's see here. Ah, uh, it appears we will be going to USJ. Nizu's lip twitched. Please stop hacking into our systems. That's very invasive. Sorry, can't help it. It's like an open door with a sign that practically yells at you to come in. Anyways, it looks like All Might will be a participant in this. Are you saying there will be an ambush happening for All Might at the USJ? Aizawa asked with a serious expression. Tony took his food back from Aizawa's hand and began to eat it. Yup, most likely. Then we have to cancel it, Midnight advised. 
Aizawa was in agreement. No, both Tony and Nizu said at once. Nizu and Tony looked at each other before smiling. Nizu, you can't be planning on putting their lives in danger, are you? Midnight asked with worry. I will take full responsibility if it comes to that, Nizu said. Nizu turned towards Tony and Melissa. You two can go to class now. Thank you for your help. It was much appreciated. Aha, uh -huh, Tony said as he finished the last bit of his food. As Tony and Melissa started walking away, Melissa turned towards Tony and asked, Why did you and Nizu agree not to cancel the event? Because he's planning on using the villains and this event to make us grow. Diamonds only shine through with pressure. Is he crazy? This could go wrong in so many ways. It could, but he has faith in one thing. Uncle Might. Yup. After school, back in his lab, Tony had a pensive look. The USJ is about to begin. Who knows what other variables are in store? I can't just solely depend on the skin suit. Friday, control the suits to help me build some things I have in mind, Tony commanded. The casings for all the suits suddenly lifted up and all the eyes of the suits flashed on before they began walking towards him. Tamura was sitting on a bar stool. In front of him was Kurojiri cleaning glass cups with a towel. Tamura turned towards two TV screens, one hoisted up showing the news and the other a box TV with a barely visible person. A few years ago you mentioned All Might being injured and not being able to perform his hero duties like he used to. But the more I see him, the more he looks like his old self. Are you sure he's injured? Tamura asked as he looked towards the figure on the TV. It appears he found someone to cure him of his rather troublesome injuries. It still has taken a lot out of him. He isn't as strong as he used to be, that I can assure you, but he's still strong. Stronger than I am. Tamura said with gritted teeth as he began to scratch his neck. Ha ha ha. Worry not. As another reassurance, I will give you more than one Nomu. That should calm your nerves. I still want you to go ahead with the plan. As long as I can extinguish the symbol of peace, that is all that matters. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much and it keeps me going. Plus, it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.